Section 1 of Chapter 17 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 1. On the 18th of January, 1691, the king, having been detained some days by adverse winds, went aboard at Gravesend. Four yachts had been fitted up for him and his retinue. Among his attendants were Norfolk, Ormond, Devonshire, Dorset, Portland, Monmouth, Zulstein, and the Bishop of London. Two distinguished admirals, Cloudsley Shovel and George Rook, commanded the men-of-war which formed the convoy. The passage was tedious and disagreeable. During many hours the fleet was becalmed off the Godwin Sands, and it was not till the fifth day that the soundings proved the coast of Holland to be near. The sea fog was so thick that no land could be seen, and it was not thought safe for the ships to proceed further in the darkness. William, tired out by the voyage, and impatient to be once more in his beloved country, determined to land in an open boat. The noblemen who were in his train tried to dissuade him from risking so valuable a life, but when they found that his mind was made up, they insisted on sharing the danger. That danger proved to be more serious than they had expected. It was supposed that in an hour the party would be ashore, but great masses of floating ice impeded the progress of the skiff. The night came on, the fog grew thicker, the waves broke over the king and the courtiers. Once the keel struck on a sandbank, and was with great difficulty got off. The hardiest mariners showed some signs of uneasiness, but William, through the whole night, was as composed as if he had been in the drawing-room at Kensington. For shame, he said to one of the dismayed sailors, are you afraid to die in my company? A bold Dutch seaman ventured to spring out, and with great difficulty swam and scrambled through breakers, ice and mud, to firm ground. Here he discharged a musket and lighted a fire as a signal that he was safe. None of his fellow passengers, however, thought it prudent to follow his example. They lay tossing in sight of the flame which he had kindled, till the first pale light of a January morning showed them that they were close to the island of Gore. The king and his lords, stiff with cold and covered with icicles, gladly landed to warm and rest themselves. After reposing some hours in the hut of a peasant, William proceeded to the Hague. He was impatiently expected, therefore, Though the fleet which had brought him was not visible from the shore, the royal salutes had been heard through the mist, and had apprised the whole coast of his arrival. Thousands had assembled at Hanslerdijk to welcome him with applause which came from their hearts and which went to his heart. That was one of the few white days of a life, beneficent indeed and glorious, but far from happy. After more than two years passed in a strange land, the exile had again set foot on his native soil. He heard again the language of his nursery. He saw again the scenery and the architecture which were inseparably associated in his mind with the recollections of childhood and the sacred feelings of home. The dreary mounds of sand, shells and weeds on which the waves of the German Ocean broke, the interminable meadows intersected by trenches, the straight canals, the villas bright with paint and adorned with quaint images and inscriptions. He had lived, during many weary months, among a people who did not love him, who did not understand him, who could never forget that he was a foreigner. Those Englishmen who served him most faithfully served him without enthusiasm, without personal attachment, and merely from a sense of public duty. In their hearts they were sorry that they had no choice but between an English tyrant and a Dutch deliverer. All was now changed. William was among a population by which he was adored, as Elizabeth had been adored when she rode through her army at Tilbury, as Charles the Second had been adored when he landed at Dover. It is true that the old enemies of the House of Orange had not been inactive during the absence of the Stadtholder. There had been, not indeed clamors, but mutterings against him. He had, it was said, neglected his native land for his new kingdom. Whenever the dignity of the English flag, whenever the prosperity of the English trade was concerned, he forgot that he was a Hollander. But as soon as his well-remembered face was again seen, all jealousy, all coldness was at an end. 
There was not a boar, not a fisherman, not an artisan in the crowd which lined the roads from Hanseldijk to the Hague, whose heart did not swell with pride at the thought that the first minister of Holland had become a great king, had freed the English, and had conquered the Irish. It would have been madness in William to travel from Hampton Court to Westminster without a guard, but in his own land he needed no swords or carbines to defend him. Do not keep the people off, he cried. Let them come close to me. They are all my good friends. He soon learned that sumptuous preparations were making for his entrance into the Hague. At first he murmured and objected. He detested, he said, noise and display. The necessary cost of the war was quite heavy enough. He hoped that his fellow townsmen would consider him as a neighbor, born and bred among them, and would not pay him so bad a compliment as to treat him ceremoniously. But all his expostulations were vain. The Hollanders, simple and parsimonious as their ordinary habits were, had set their hearts on giving their illustrious countrymen a reception suited to his dignity and to his merit. He found it necessary to yield. On the day of his triumph, the concourse was immense. All the wheeled carriages and horses of the province were too few for the multitude of those who flocked to the show. Many thousands came sliding or skating along the frozen canals from Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Leiden, Harlem, Delft. At ten in the morning of the 26th of January, the great bell of the townhouse gave the signal. Sixteen hundred substantial burghers, well armed and clad in the finest dresses which were to be found in the recesses of their wardrobe, kept order in the crowded streets. Balconies and scaffolds, embowered in evergreens and hung with tapestry, hid the windows. The royal coach, escorted by an army of halberdiers and running footmen, and followed by a long train of splendid equipages, passed under the numerous arches rich with carving and painting, amidst incessant shouts of Long live the King, our Stadtholder! The front of the town house and the whole circuit of the marketplace were in a blaze of brilliant colors. Civic crowns, trophies, emblems of art, of sciences, of commerce, and of agriculture appeared everywhere. In one place William saw portrayed the glorious actions of his ancestors. There was the silent prince, the founder of the Batavian Commonwealth, passing the muse with his warriors. There was the more impetuous Maurice leading a charge at Newport. A little further on, the hero might retrace the eventful story of his own life. He was a child at his widowed mother's knee. He was at the altar with Derry's hand in his. He was landing at Torbay. He was swimming through the Boyne. There, too, was a boat amidst the ice and the breakers, and above it was most appropriately inscribed, in the majestic language of Rome, the saying of the great Roman, What dost thou fear? Thou hast Caesar on board. The task of furnishing the Latin mottoes had been entrusted to two men who, till Bentley appeared, held the highest place among the classical scholars of that age. Spanheim, whose knowledge of the Roman medals was unrivaled, imitated, not unsuccessfully, the noble consciousness of those ancient legends which he had assiduously studied, and he was assisted by Gravius, who then filled a chair at Utrecht, and whose just reputation had drawn to that university multitudes of students from every part of Protestant Europe. When the night came, fireworks were exhibited on the great tank which washes the palaces of the Federation. That tank was now as hard as marble, and the Dutch boasted that nothing had ever been seen, even on the terrace of Versailles, more brilliant than the effect produced by the innumerable cascades of flame which were reflected in the smooth mirror of ice. The English lords congratulated their master on his immense popularity. Yes, said he, but I am not the favorite. The shouting was nothing to what it would have been if Mary had been with me. A few hours after the triumphal entry, the king attended a sitting of the States General. His last appearance among them had been on the day in which he embarked for England. He had then, amidst the broken words and loud weepings of those grave senators, thanked them for the kindness which, which they had watched over his childhood, trained his young mind, and supported his authority in his riper years, and he had solemnly commended his beloved wife to their care. 
he now came back among them the king of three kingdoms, the head of the greatest coalition that Europe had seen during a hundred and eighty years, and nothing was heard in the hall but applause and congratulations. But this time the streets of the hog were overflowing with the equipages and retinues of princes and ambassadors who came flocking to the great congress. First appeared the ambitious and ostentatious Frederick, elector of Brandenburg, who, a few years later, took the title of King of Prussia. Then arrived the young elector of Bavaria, the regent of Württemberg, the landgraves of Hesse Castle and Hesse Darmstadt, and a long train of sovereign princes sprung from the illustrious houses of Brunswick, of Saxony, of Holstein, and of Nassau. The Marquis of Gastonega, governor of the Spanish Netherlands, repaired to the assembly from the viceregal court of Brussels. Extraordinary ministers had been sent by the emperor, by the kings of Spain, Poland, Denmark, and Sweden, and by the Duke of Savoy. There was scarcely room in the town and the neighborhood for the English lords and gentlemen and the German counts and barons whom curiosity or official duty had brought to the place of meeting. The grave capital of the most thrifty and industrious of nations was as gay as Venice in Carnival. The walks cut among those noble limes and elms in which the villa of the Prince of Orange is embosomed were gay with the plumes, the stars, the flowing wigs, the embroidered coats, and the gold-hilted swords of the gallants of London, Berlin, and Vienna. With the nobles were mingled sharpers not less gorgeously attired than they. At night the hazard tables were thronged, and the theatres were filled to the roof. Princely banquets followed one another in rapid succession. The meats were served in gold, and, according to that old Teutonic fashion with which Shakespeare had made his countrymen familiar, as often as any of the great princes proposed a health, the kettle drums and trumpets sounded. Some English lords, particularly Devonshire, gave entertainments which vied with those of sovereigns. It was remarked that the German potentates, though generously disposed to be litigious and punctilious about etiquette, associated, on this occasion, in an unceremonious manner, and seemed to have forgotten their passion for genealogical and heraldic controversy. The taste for wine, which was then characteristic of their nation, they had not forgotten. At the table of the Elector of Brandenburg, much mirth was caused by the gravity of the statesmen of Holland, who, sober themselves, confuted out of Grotius and Puffendorf the nonsense stuttered by the tipsy nobles of the empire. One of those nobles swallowed so many bumpers that he tumbled into the turf fire, and was not pulled out till his fine velvet suit had been burned. In the midst of all this revelry, business was not neglected. A formal meeting of the Congress was held at which William presided. In a short and dignified speech, which was speedily circulated throughout Europe, he set forth the necessity of firm union and strenuous exertion. The profound respect which which he was heard by that splendid assembly caused bitter mortification to his enemies both in England and in France. The German potentates were bitterly reviled for yielding precedence to an upstart. Indeed, the most illustrious among them paid to him such marks of deference as they would scarcely have deigned to pay to the imperial majesty, mingled with the crowd in his antechamber, and at his table behaved as respectfully as any English lord in waiting. In one caricature, the allied princes were represented as muzzled bearers, some with crowns, some with caps of state. William had them all on a chain and was teaching them to dance. In another caricature, he appeared taking his ease in an armchair, with his feet on a cushion, and his hat on his head, while the electors of Brandenburg and Bavaria, uncovered, occupied small stools on the right and the left. The crowd of landgraves and sovereign dukes stood at humble distance, and Gastonjega, the unworthy successor of Alva, awaited the orders of the heretic tyrant on bended knee. It was soon announced by authority that, before the beginning of the summer, 220,000 men would be in the field against France. The contingent which each of the Allied powers was to furnish was made known. Matters about which it would have been inexpedient to put forth any declaration were privately discussed by the King of England and his allies. On this occasion, as on every other important occasion during his reign, he was his own Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
it was necessary for the sake of form that he should be attended by a secretary of state, and Nottingham had therefore followed him to Holland. But Nottingham, though, in matters concerning the internal government of England, he enjoyed a large share of his master's confidence, knew little more about the business of the Congress than what he saw in the gazettes. This mode of transacting business would now be thought to be most unconstitutional, and many writers applying the standards of their own age to the transactions of a former age have severely blamed William for acting without the advice of his ministers and his ministers for submitting to be kept in ignorance of transactions which deeply concerned the honor of the crown and the welfare of the nation. Yet surely the presumption is that what the most honest and honorable men of both parties, Nottingham, for example, among the Tories and Summers among the Whigs, not only did but avowed, cannot have been altogether inexcusable, and a very sufficient excuse will without difficulty be found." The doctrine that the sovereign is not responsible is doubtless as old as any part of our Constitution. The doctrine that his ministers are responsible is also of immemorial antiquity. That where there is no responsibility, there can be no trustworthy security against maladministration is a doctrine which, in our age and country, few people will be inclined to dispute. From these three propositions it plainly follows that the administration is likely to be best conducted when the sovereign performs no public act without the concurrence and instrumentality of a minister. This argument is perfectly sound. But we must remember that arguments are constructed in one way and governments in another. In logic, none but an idiot admits the premises and denies the legitimate conclusion. But in practice, we see that great and enlightened communities often persist, generation after generation, in asserting principles and refusing to act upon those principles. It may be doubted whether any real polity that ever existed has exactly corresponded to the pure idea of that polity. According to the pure idea of constitutional royalty, the prince reigns and does not govern. And constitutional royalty, as it now exists in England, comes nearer than in any other country to the pure idea. Yet it would be a great error to imagine that our princes merely reign and never govern. In the 17th century, both Whigs and Tories thought it not only the right but the duty of the first magistrate to govern. All parties agreed in blaming Charles II for not being his own prime minister. All parties agreed in praising James for being his own Lord High Admiral and all parties thought it natural and reasonable that William should be his own foreign secretary. It may be observed that the ablest and best informed of those who have censured the manner in which the negotiations of that time were conducted are scarcely consistent with themselves. For while they blame William for being his own ambassador plenipotentiary at the Hog, they praise him for being his own commander-in-chief in Ireland. Yet where is the distinction in principle between the two cases? Surely every reason which can be brought to prove that he violated the Constitution when, by his own sole authority, he made compacts with the Emperor and the Elector of Brandenburg will equally prove that he violated the Constitution when, by his own sole authority, he ordered one column to plunge into the water at Old Bridge and another to cross the bridge of the Slyne. If the Constitution gave him the command of the forces of the state, the Constitution gave him also the direction of the foreign relations of the state. On what principle, then, can it be maintained that he was at liberty to exercise the former power without consulting anybody, but that he was bound to exercise the latter power in conformity with the advice of a minister? Will it be said that an heir in diplomacy is likely to be more injurious to the country than an heir in strategy? Surely not. It is hardly conceivable that any blunder which William might have made at the Hague could have been more injurious to the public interest than a defeat at the Boyne. Or will it be said that there was greater reason for placing confidence in his military than in his diplomatic skills? Surely not. In a war he showed some great moral and intellectual qualities, but as a tactician he did not rank high and of his many campaigns, only two were decidedly successful. In the talents of a negotiator, on the other hand, he has never been surpassed. Of the interests and tempers of the continental courts, he knew more than all his privy council together. 
Some of his ministers were doubtless men of great ability, excellent orators in the House of Lords, and versed in our insular politics. But in the deliberations of the Congress, Carmarthen and Nottingham would have been found as far inferior to him as he would have been found inferior to them in a parliamentary debate on a question purely English. The coalition against France was his work. He alone had joined together the parts of that great whole, and he alone could keep them together. If he had trusted that vast and complicated machine in the hands of any of his subjects, it would instantly have fallen to pieces. End of section 1. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 2, Chapter 17 of The History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.T. Macduff. A History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 2. Some things indeed were to be done which none of his subjects would have ventured to do. Pope Alexander was really, though not in name, one of the Allies. It was of the highest importance to have him for a friend. And yet such was the temper of the English nation that an English minister might well shrink from having any dealings, direct or indirect, with the Vatican. The secretaries of state were glad to leave a matter so delicate and so full of risk to their master, and to be able to protest with truth that not a line to which the most intolerant Protestant could object had ever gone out of their offices. It must not be supposed, however, that William ever forgot that his especial, his hereditary mission, was to protect the Reformed faith. His influence with the Roman Catholic princes was constantly and strenuously exerted for the benefit of their Protestant subjects. In the spring of 1691, the Waldensian shepherds, long and cruelly persecuted and weary of their lives, were surprised by glad tidings. Those who had been in prison for heresy returned to their homes. Children, who had been taken from their parents to be educated by priests, were sent back. Congregations, which had hitherto met only by stealth and with extreme peril, now worshipped God without molestation in the face of the day. Those simple mountaineers probably never knew that their fate had been a subject of discussion at The Hague, and that they owed the happiness of their firesides and the security of their humble temples to the ascendancy which William exercised over the Duke of Savoy. No coalition of which history has preserved the memory has had an abler chief than William. But even William often contended in vain against those vices which are inherent in the nature of all coalitions. No undertaking which requires the hearty and long-continued cooperation of many independent states is likely to prosper. Jealousies inevitably spring up, disputes engender disputes. Every confederate is tempted to throw on others some part of the burden which he ought himself to bear. Scarcely one honestly furnishes the promised contingent, scarcely one exactly observes the appointed day. But perhaps no coalition that ever existed was in such constant danger of dissolution as the coalition which William had with infinite difficulty formed. The long list of potentates who met in person or by their representatives at The Hague looked well in the gazettes. The crowd of princely equipages attended by many-colored guards and lackeys looked well among the lime trees of the Voorhout. But the very circumstances which made the Congress more splendid than other Congresses made the lead weaker than other leagues. The more numerous the Allies, the more numerous were the dangers which threatened the alliance. It was impossible that twenty governments, divided by quarrels about precedence, quarrels about territory, quarrels about trade, quarrels about religion, could long act together in perfect harmony. That they act together during several years in imperfect harmony is to be ascribed to the wisdom, patience, and firmness of William. The situation of his great enemy was very different. The resources of the French monarchy, though certainly not equal to those of England, Holland, the House of Austria, and the Empire of Germany united, were yet very formidable. They were all collected in a central position. They were all under the absolute direction of a single mind. Louis could do with two words what William could hardly bring about by two months of negotiation at Berlin, Munich, Brussels, Turin, and Vienna. Thus, France was found equal in effective strength to all the states which were combined against her, for in the political, as in the natural world, 
there may be an equality of momentum between unequal bodies when the body which is inferior in weight is superior in velocity. This was soon signally proved. In March, the princes and ambassadors who had been assembled at the Hague separated, and scarcely had they separated when all their plans were disconcerted by a bold and skillful move of the enemy. Louis was sensible that the meeting of the Congress was likely to produce a great effect on the public mind of Europe. That effect he determined to counteract by striking a sudden and terrible blow. While his enemies were settling how many troops each of them should furnish, he ordered numerous divisions of his army to march from widely distant points towards Mons, one of the most important, if not the most important, of the fortresses which protected the Spanish Netherlands. His purpose was discovered only when it was all but accomplished. William, who had retired for a few days to Lou, learned with surprise and extreme vexation that cavalry, infantry, artillery, bridges of boats were fast approaching the fated city by many converging routes. A hundred thousand men had been brought together. All the implements of war had been largely provided by Louvois, the first of living administrators. The command was entrusted to Luxembourg, the first of living generals. The scientific operations were directed by Vauban, the first of living engineers, that nothing might be wanting which could kindle emulation through all the ranks of a gallant and loyal army. The magnificent king himself had set out from Versailles for the camp. Yet William had still some faint hope that it might be possible to raise the siege. He flew to the Hague, put all the forces of the States General in motion, and sent pressing messages to the German princes. Within three weeks after he had received the first hint of the danger, He was in the neighborhood of the besieged city, at the head of nearly 50,000 troops of different nations. To attack a superior force commanded by such a captain as Luxembourg was a bold, almost a desperate enterprise. Yet William was so sensitive that the loss of Mons would be an almost irreparable disaster and disgrace that he made up his mind to run the hazard. He was convinced that the event of the siege would determine the policy of the courts of Stockholm and Copenhagen. Those courts had lately seemed inclined to join the coalition. If Mons fell, they would certainly remain neutral. They might possibly become hostile. The risk, he wrote to Heinzius, is great. Yet I am not without hope. I will do what can be done. The issue is in the hands of God. On the very day in which this letter was written, Mons fell. The siege had been vigorously pressed. Louis himself, though suffering from the gout, had set the example of strenuous exertion. His household troops, the finest body of soldiers in Europe, had, under his eye, surpassed themselves. The young nobles of his court had tried to attract his notice by exposing themselves to the hottest fire with the same gay alacrity with which they were wont to exhibit their graceful figures at his balls. His wounded soldiers were charmed by the benignant courtesy with which he walked among their pallets, assisted while wounds were dressed by the hospital surgeons and breakfasted on a porringer of the hospital broth. While all was obedience and enthusiasm among the besiegers, all was disunion and dismay among the besieged. The duty of the French lines was so well performed that no messenger sent by William was able to cross them. The garrison did not know that relief was close at hand. The burghers were appalled by the prospect of those horrible calamities which befall cities taken by storm. Showers of shells and red-hot bullets were falling in the streets. The town was on fire in ten places at once. The peaceful inhabitants derived an unwanted courage from the excess of their fear and rose on the soldiers. Thenceforth, resistance was impossible, and a capitulation was concluded. The armies then retired into quarters. Military operations were suspended during some weeks. Louis returned in triumph to Versailles, and William paid a short visit to England, where his presence was much needed. He found the ministers still employed in tracing out the ramifications of the plot which had been discovered just before his departure. Early in January, Preston, Ashton, and Elliot had been arraigned at the Old Bailey. They claimed the right of severing in their challenges. It was therefore necessary to try them separately. The audience was numerous and splendid. Many peers were present. The Lord President and two secretaries of state attended in order to prove that the papers produced in court were the same which Philip had brought to Whitehall. A considerable number of judges appeared on the bench, and Holt presided. A full report of the proceedings has come down to us and well deserves to be attentively studied and to be compared with the reports of other trials which had not long before taken place under the same roof. The whole spirit of the tribunal had undergone in a few months a change so complete 
that it might seem to have been the work of ages. Twelve years earlier, unhappy Roman Catholics, accused of wickedness which had never entered into their thoughts, had stood in that dock. The witnesses for the crown had repeated their hideous fictions amidst the applauding hums of the audience. The judges had shared, or had pretended to share, the stupid credulity and the savage passions of the populace, had exchanged smiles and compliments with the perjured informers, had roared down the arguments feebly stammered forth by the prisoners, and had not been ashamed, in passing the sentence of death, to make ribald jests on purgatory and the mass. As soon as the butchery of Pappas was over, the butchery of Whigs had commenced, and the judges had applied themselves to their new work with even more than their old barbarity. To these scandals the revolution had put an end. Whoever, after perusing the trials of Ireland and Pickering, of Grove and Berry, of Sydney, Cornish, and Alice Lyle, turns to the trials of Preston and Ashton, will be astonished by the contrast. The Solicitor General, Summers, conducted the prosecutions with the moderation and humanity of which his predecessors had left him no example. I did never think, he said, that it was the part of any who were of counsel for the king in cases of this nature to aggravate the crime of the prisoners, or to put false colors on the evidence. Holt's conduct was faultless. Pollexfen, an older man than Holt or Summers, retained a little, and a little was too much, of the tone of that bad school in which he had been bred. But though he once or twice forgot the austere decorum of his place, he cannot be accused of any violation of substantial justice. The prisoners themselves seem to have been surprised by the fairness and gentleness with which they were treated. "'I would not mislead the jury, I'll assure you,' said Holt to Preston, "'nor do your lordship any manner of injury in the world.' "'No, my lord,' said Preston, "'I see it well enough that your lordship would not.' Whatever my fate may be, said Ashton, I cannot but own that I have had a fair trial for my life. The culprits gained nothing by the moderation of the Solicitor General, or by the impartiality of the court, for the evidence was irresistible. The meaning of the paper seized by Billup was so plain that the dullest juryman could not misunderstand it. Of those papers, part was fully proved to be in Preston's handwriting. Part was in Ashton's handwriting, but this the counsel for the prosecution had not the means of proving. They therefore rested the case against Ashton on the indisputable facts that the treasonable packet had been found in his bosom, and that he had used language which was quite unintelligible except on the supposition that he had a guilty knowledge of the contents. Both Preston and Ashton were convicted and sentenced to death. Ashton was speedily executed. He might have saved his life by making disclosures. But though he declared that, if he were spared, he would always be a faithful subject of their majesties, he was fully resolved not to give up the names of his accomplices. In this resolution he was encouraged by the non-juring divines who attended him in his cell. It was probably by their influence that he was induced to deliver to the sheriffs on the scaffold a declaration which he had transcribed and signed, but had not, it is to be hoped, composed or attentively considered." In this paper he was made to complain of the unfairness of a trial which he himself in public acknowledged to have been eminently fair. He was also made to aver, on the word of a dying man, that he knew nothing of the papers which had been found upon him. Unfortunately, his declaration, when inspected, proved to be in the same handwriting with one of the most important of those papers. He died with manly fortitude. Elliot was not brought to trial. The evidence against him was not quite so clear as that on which his associates had been convicted, and he was not worth the anger of the government. The fate of Preston was long in suspense. The Jacobites affected to be confident that the government would not dare to shed his blood. He was, they said, a favorite at Versailles, and his death would be followed by a terrible retaliation. They scattered about the streets of London papers in which it was asserted that, if any harm befell him, Mountjoy and all the other Englishmen of quality who were prisoners in France would be broken on the wheel. These absurd threats would not have deferred the execution one day. But those who had Preston in their power were not unwilling to spare him on certain conditions. He was privy to all the counsels of the disaffected party and could furnish information of the highest value. He was informed that his fate depended on himself. The struggle was long and severe. Pride, conscience, party spirit were on one side, the intense love of life on the other. He went during a time irresolutely to and fro. He listened to his brother Jacobites, and his courage rose. 
He listened to the agents of the government, and his heart sank within him. In an evening, when he had dined and drunk his claret, he feared nothing. He would die like a man, rather than save his neck by an act of baseness. But his temper was very different when he woke the next morning, when the courage which he had drawn from wine and company had evaporated, when he was alone with the iron grates and stone walls, and when the thought of the block, the axe, and the sawdust rose in his mind. During some time he regularly wrote a confession every forenoon when he was sober, and burned it every night when he was merry. His non-juring friends formed a plan for bringing Sancroft to visit the tower, in the hope, doubtless, that the exhortations of so great a prelate and so great a saint would confirm the wavering virtue of the prisoner. Whether this plan would have been successful may be doubted. It was not carried into effect. The fatal hour drew near, and the fortitude of Preston gave way. He confessed his guilt and named Clarendon, Dartmouth, the Bishop of Ely, and William Penn as his accomplices. He added a long list of persons against whom he could not himself give evidence, but who, if he could trust to Penn's assurances, were friendly to King James. Among these persons were Devonshire and Dorset. There's not the slightest reason to believe that either of these great noblemen ever had any dealings, direct or indirect, with St. Germain. It is not, however, necessary to accuse Penn of deliberate falsehood. He was credulous and garrulous. The Lord Steward and the Lord Chamberlain had shared in the vexation with which their party had observed the leaning of William towards the Tories, and they had probably expressed that vexation unguardedly. So weak a man as Penn, wishing to find Jacobites everywhere, and prone to believe whatever he wished, might easily put an erroneous construction on invective such as the haughty and irritable Devonshire was but too ready to utter, and on sarcasm such as, in moments of spleen, dropped but too easily from the lips of the keen-witted Dorset. Care Martin, a Tory, and a Tory who had been mercilessly persecuted by the Whigs, was deposed to make the most of this idle hearsay. But he received no encouragement from his master, who, of all the great politicians mentioned in history, was the least prone to suspicion. When William returned to England, Preston was brought before him and was commanded to repeat the confession which had already been made to the ministers. The king stood behind the Lord President's chair and listened gravely while Clarendon, Dartmouth, Turner, and Penn were named. But as soon as the prisoner, passing from what he could himself testify, began to repeat the stories which Penn had told him, William touched Care Martin on the shoulder and said, My lord, we have had too much of this. This judicious magnanimity had its proper reward. Devonshire and Dorset became from that day more zealous than ever in the cause of the master who, in spite of calumny for which their own indiscretion had perhaps furnished some ground, had continued to repose confidence in their loyalty. Even those who were undoubtedly criminal were generally treated with great leniency. Clarendon lay in the tower about six months. His guilt was fully established, and a party among the Whigs called loudly and importunately for his head. But he was saved by the pathetic entreaties of his brother Rochester, by the good offices of the humane and generous Burnet, and by Mary's respect for the memory of her mother. The prisoner's confinement was not strict. He was allowed to entertain his friends at dinner. When at length his health began to suffer from restraint, he was permitted to go into the country under the care of a warder. The warder was soon removed, and Clarendon was informed that, while he led a quiet rural life, he should not be molested. The treason of Dartmouth was of no common dye. He was an English seaman, and he had laid a plan for betraying Portsmouth to the French, and had offered to take the command of a French squadron against his country. It was a serious aggravation of his guilt that he had been one of the very first persons who took the oaths to William and Mary. He was arrested and brought to the council chamber. A narrative of what passed there, written by himself, has been preserved. In that narrative, he admits that he was treated with great courtesy and delicacy. He vehemently asserted his innocence. He declared that he had never corresponded with St. Germain, that he was no favorite there, and that Mary of Modena in particular owed him a grudge. My lords, he said, I am an Englishman. I always, when the interest of the House of Bourbon was strongest here, shunned the French, both men and women. I would lose the last drop of my blood rather than see Portsmouth in the power of foreigners. I am not such a fool as to think that King Louis would conquer us merely for the benefit of King James. I am certain that nothing can be truly imputed to me beyond some foolish talk over a bottle. His protestation seemed to have produced some effect, for he was at first permitted to remain in the gentle custody of the Black Rod. On further inquiry, however, it was determined to send him to the tower. 
After a confinement of a few weeks, he died of apoplexy. But he lived long enough to complete his disgrace by offering his sword to the new government and by expressing in fervent language his hope that he might, by the goodness of God and of their majesties, have an opportunity of showing how much he hated the French. End of section two. Recording by S. T. Macduff. Chapter Seventeen of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. T. Macduff. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter Seventeen, Section Four. Turner ran no serious risk, for the government was most unwilling to send to the scaffold one of the seven who had signed the memorable petition. A warrant was, however, issued for his apprehension, and his friends had little hope that he would escape, for his nose was such as none who had seen it could forget, and it was to little purpose that he put on a flowing wig and that he suffered his beard to grow. The pursuit was probably not very hot, for after skulking a few weeks in England, he succeeded in crossing the Channel. And remained some time in France. A warrant was issued against Penn, and he narrowly escaped the messengers. It chanced that on the day on which they were sent in search of him, he was attending a remarkable ceremony at some distance from his home. An event had taken place which a historian, whose object is to record the real life of a nation, ought not to pass unnoticed. While London was agitated by the news that a plot had been discovered, George Fox, the founder of the sect of Quakers, died. More than forty years had elapsed since Fox had begun to see visions and to cast out devils. He was then a youth of pure morals and grave deportment, with a perverse temper, with the education of a laboring man, and with an intellect in the most unhappy of all states. That is to say, too much disordered for liberty, and not sufficiently disordered for bedlam. The circumstances in which he was placed were such as could scarcely fail to bring out, in the strongest form, the constitutional diseases of his mind. At the time when his faculties were ripening. Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Independents, Baptists were striving for mastery, and were in every corner of the realm refuting and reviling each other. He wandered from congregation to congregation. He heard priests harangue against Puritans. He heard Puritans harangue against priests, and he in vain applied for spiritual direction and consolation to doctors of both parties. One jolly old clergyman of the Anglican Communion told him to smoke tobacco and sing psalms. Another advised him to go and lose some blood. The young inquirer turned in disgust from these advisers to the dissenters and found them also blind guides. After some time, he came to the conclusion that no human being was competent to instruct him in divine things, and that the truth had been communicated to him by direct inspiration from heaven. He argued that as the division of languages began at Babel, and as the persecutors of Christ put on the cross an inscription in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. The knowledge of languages, and more especially of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, must be useless to a Christian minister. Indeed, he was so far from knowing many languages that he knew none. Nor can the most corrupt passage in Hebrew be more unintelligible to the unlearned than his English often is to the most acute and attentive reader. One of the precious truths which were divinely revealed to this new apostle was that it was falsehood and adulation to use the second person plural instead of the second person singular. Another was that to talk of the month of March was to worship the bloodthirsty god Mars, and that to talk of Monday was to pay idolatrous homage to the moon. To say good morning or good evening was highly reprehensible, for those phrases evidently imported that God had made bad days and bad nights. A Christian was bound to face death itself rather than touch his hat to the greatest of mankind. When Fox was challenged to produce any scriptural authority for this dogma, he cited the passage in which it is written that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace with their hats on, and if his own narrative may be trusted, the Chief Justice of England was altogether unable to answer this argument except by crying out, "Take him away, jailer!" Fox insisted much on the not less weighty argument that the Turks never show their bare heads to their superiors, and he asked with great animation whether those who bore the noble name of Christians ought not to surpass Turks in virtue. Bowing, he strictly prohibited, and indeed seemed to consider it as the effect of satanical influence. 
For, as he observed, the woman in the gospel, while she had a spirit of infirmity, was bowed together and ceased to bow as soon as divine power had liberated her from the tyranny of the evil one. His expositions of the sacred writings were of a very peculiar kind. Passages which had been in the apprehension of all the readers of the Gospels during 16th centuries figurative, he construed literally. Passages which no human being before him had ever understood in any other than a literal sense, he construed figuratively. Thus, from those rhetorical expressions in which the duty of patience under injury is enjoined, he deduced the doctrine that self-defense against pirates and assassins is unlawful. On the other hand, the plain commands to baptize with water and to partake of bread and wine in commemoration of the redemption of mankind, he pronounced to be allegorical. He long wandered from place to place teaching this strange theology, shaking like an aspen leaf in his paroxysms of fanatical excitement, forcing his way into churches, which he nicknamed steeple houses, interrupting prayers and sermons with clamor and scurrility, and pestering rectors and justices with epistles much resembling burlesques of those sublime odes in which the Hebrew prophets foretold the calamities of Babylon and Tyre. He soon acquired great notoriety by these feats. His strange face, his strange chant, his immovable hat and his leather breeches were known all over the country. And he boasts that as soon as the rumor was heard, the man in leather breeches is coming, terror seized hypocritical professors and hireling priests made haste to get out of his way. He was repeatedly imprisoned and set in the stocks, sometimes justly, for disturbing the public worship of congregations, and sometimes unjustly, for merely talking nonsense. He soon gathered round him a body of disciples, some of whom went beyond himself in absurdity. He has told us that one of his friends walked naked through Skipton declaring the truth, and that another was divinely moved to go naked during several years to marketplaces and to the houses of gentlemen and clergymen. Fox complains bitterly that these pious acts, prompted by the Holy Spirit, were requited by an untoward generation with hooting, pelting, coach-whipping, and horse-whipping. But though he applauded the zeal of his sufferers, he did not go quite to their lengths. He sometimes, indeed, was impelled to strip himself partially. Thus he pulled off his shoes and walked barefoot through Litchfield, crying, Woe to the bloody city! But it does not appear that he ever thought it his duty to appear before the public without that decent garment from which his popular appellation was derived. If we form our judgment of George Fox simply by looking at his own actions and writings, we shall see no reason for placing him morally or intellectually above Ludowick Muggleton or Joanna Southcote but it would be most unjust to rank the sect which regards him as its founder with the Muggletorians or the South Codians. It chanced that among the thousands whom his enthusiasm infected were a few persons whose abilities and attainments were of a very different order from his own. Robert Barclay was a man of considerable parts and learning. William Penn, though inferior to Barclay in both natural and acquired abilities, was a gentleman and a scholar. That such men should have become the followers of George Fox ought not to astonish any person who remembers what quick, vigorous, and highly cultivated intellects were in our own times duped by the unknown tongues. The truth is that no powers of mind constitute a security against errors of this description. Touching God and his ways with man, the highest human faculties can discover little more than the meanest. In theology, the interval is small indeed between Aristotle and a child, between Archimedes and a naked savage. It is not strange, therefore, that wise men, weary of investigation, tormented by uncertainty, longing to believe something, and yet seeing objections to everything, should submit themselves absolutely to teachers who, with firm and undoubting faith, lay claim to a supernatural commission. Thus we frequently see inquisitive and restless spirits take refuge from their own skepticism in the bosom of a church which pretends to infallibility and after questioning the existence of a deity, bring themselves to worship a wafer. And thus it was that Fox made some converts to whom he was immeasurably inferior in everything except the energy of his convictions. By these converts his rude doctrines were polished into a form somewhat less shocking to good sense and good taste. No preposition which he laid down was retracted. No indecent or ridiculous act which he had done or approved was condemned. But what was most grossly absurd in his theories and practices was softened down, or at least not obtruded on the public. Whatever could be made to appear specious was set in the fairest light. His gibberish was translated into English. Meanings which he would have been quite unable to comprehend were put on his phrases. 
and his system, so much improved that he would not have known it again, was defended by numerous citations from pagan philosophers and Christian fathers whose names he had never heard. Still, however, those who had remodeled his theology continued to profess, and doubtless to feel, profound reverence for him, and his crazy epistles were to the last received and read with respect in Quaker meetings all over the country. His death produced a sensation which was not confined to his own disciples. On the morning of the funeral, a great multitude assembled around the meeting house in Grace Church Street. Thence the corpse was borne to the burial ground of the sect near Bunhill Fields. Several orators addressed the crowd which filled the cemetery. Penn was conspicuous among those disciples who committed the venerable corpse to the earth. The ceremony had scarcely been finished when he learned that warrants were out against him. He instantly took flight and remained many months concealed from the public eye. A short time after his disappearance, Sidney received from him a strange communication. Penn begged for an interview, but insisted on a promise that he should be suffered to return unmolested to his hiding place. Sidney obtained the royal permission to make an appointment on these terms. Penn came to the rendezvous and spoke at length in his own defense. He declared that he was a faithful subject of King William and Queen Mary, and that if he knew of any design against them, he would discover it. Departing from his yea and nay, he protested, as in the presence of God, that he knew of no plot, and that he did not believe that there was any plot, unless the ambitious projects of the French government might be called plots. Sidney, amazed probably by hearing a person who had such an abhorrence of lies that he would not use the common forms of civility, and such an abhorrence of oaths that he would not kiss the book in a court of justice, tell something very like a lie, and confirm it by something very like an oath. He asked how, if there were really no plot, the letters and minutes which had been found on Ashton were to be explained. This question Penn evaded. If, he said, I could only see the king, I would confess everything to him freely. I would tell him much that it would be important for him to know. It's only in that way that I can be of service to him. A witness for the crown I cannot be, for my conscience will not suffer me to be sworn. He assured Sidney that the most formidable enemies of the government were the discontented Whigs. The Jacobites are not dangerous. There is not a man among them who has a common understanding. Some persons who came over from Holland with the king are much more to be dreaded. It does not appear that Penn mentioned any names. He was suffered to depart in safety. No active search was made for him. He lay hid in London during some months and then stole down to the coast of Sussex and made his escape to France. After about three years of wandering and lurking, he, by the mediation of some eminent men who overlooked his faults for the sake of his good qualities, made his peace with the government, and again ventured to resume his ministrations. The return which he made for the leniency with which he had been treated does not much raise his character. Scarcely had he again begun to harangue in public about the unlawfulness of war when he sent a messenger earnestly exhorting James to make an immediate descent on England with 30,000 men. Some months passed before the fate of Preston was decided. After several respites, the government, convinced that though he had told much he could tell more, fixed a day for his execution and ordered the sheriffs to have the machinery of death in readiness. But he was again respited, and after a delay of some weeks, obtained a pardon which, however, extended only to his life and left his property subject to all the consequences of his attainder. As soon as he was set at liberty, he gave new cause of offense and suspicion and was again arrested, examined, and sent to prison. At length he was permitted to retire, pursued by the hisses and curses of both parties, to a lonely manor house in the north riding of Yorkshire. There, at least, he had not to endure the scornful looks of old associates who had once thought him a man of dauntless courage and spotless honor, but who now pronounced that he was at best a mean-spirited coward, and hinted their suspicions that he had been from the beginning a spy and trepan. He employed the short and sad remains of his life in turning the consolation of Bethius into English. The translation was published after the translator's death. It is remarkable chiefly on account of some very unsuccessful attempts to enrich our versification with new meters, and on account of the illusions with which the preface is filled. Under a thin veil of figurative language, Preston exhibited to the public compassion or contempt his own blighted fame and broken heart. He complained that the tribunal which had sentenced him to death had dealt with him more leniently than his former friends, and that many who had never been tried by temptations like his had very cheaply earned a reputation for courage by sneering at his poltroonery 
and by bidding defiance at a distance to horrors which, when brought near, subdue even a constant spirit. The spirit of the Jacobites, which had been quelled for a time by the detection of Preston's plot, was revived by the fall of Mons. The joy of the whole party was boundless. The nonjuring priests ran backwards and forwards between Sam's Coffee House and Westminster Hall, spreading the praises of Louis and laughing at the miserable issue of the deliberations of the great Congress. In the park, the malcontents wore their biggest looks and talked sedition in their loudest tones. The most conspicuous among those swaggerers was Sir John Fenwick, who had in the late reign been high in favor and in military command, and was now an indefatigable agitator and conspirator. In his exultation, he forgot the courtesy which man owes to woman. He had more than once made himself conspicuous by his impertinence to the queen. He now ostentatiously put himself in her way when she took her airing, and while all around him uncovered and bowed low, gave her a rude stare and cocked his hat in her face. The affront was not only brutal, but cowardly, for the law had provided no punishment for mere impertinence, however gross, and the king was the only gentleman and soldier in the kingdom who could not protect his wife from contumely with his sword. All that the queen could do was to order the park keepers not to admit Sir John again within the gates. But long after her death, a day came when he had reason to wish that he had restrained his insolence. He found, by terrible proof, that of all the Jacobites, the most desperate assassins not excepted, he was the only one for whom William felt an intense personal aversion. A few days after this event, the rage of the malcontents began to flame more fiercely than ever. The detection of the conspiracy of which Preston was the chief had brought on a crisis in ecclesiastical affairs. The non-juring bishops had, during the year which followed their deprivation, continued to reside in the official mansions which had once been their own. Burnett had, at Mary's request, labored to effect a compromise. His direct interference would probably have done more harm than good. He therefore judiciously employed the agency of Rochester, who stood higher in the estimation of the non-jurors than any statesman who was not a non-juror, and of Trevor, who, worthless as he was, had considerable influence with the high church party. Sancroft and his brethren were informed that, if they would consent to perform their spiritual duty, to ordain, to institute, to confirm, and to watch over the faith and morality of the priesthood, a bill should be brought into Parliament to excuse them from taking the oaths. This offer was imprudently liberal, but those to whom it was made could not consistently accept it. For in the ordination service, and indeed in almost every service in the church, William and Mary were designated as king and queen. The only promise that could be obtained from the deprived prelates was that they would live quietly, and even this promise they had not all kept. One of them, at least, had been guilty of treason aggravated by impiety. He had, under the strong fear of being butchered by the populace, declared that he abhorred the thought of calling in the aid of France, and had invoked God to attest the sincerity of this declaration. Yet a short time after, he had been detected in plotting to bring a French army into England, and he had written to assure the court of St. Germain that he was acting in concert with his brethren, and especially with Sancroft. The Whigs called loudly for severity. Even the Tory councillors of William owned that indulgence had been carried to the extreme point. They made, however, a last attempt to mediate. "'Will you and your brethren,' said Trevor to Lloyd, the non-juring bishop of Norwich, "'disown all connection with Dr. Turner, and declare that what he has in his letters imputed to you is false?' Lloyd evaded the question. It was now evident that William's forbearance had only emboldened the adversaries whom he had hoped to conciliate. Even Caermarthen, even Nottingham, declared that it was high time to fill the vacant seas. End of section four. Recording by S. T. Macduff. Section 4 of Chapter 17 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. T. Macduff. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 4. Tillotson was nominated to the archbishopric and was consecrated on Whitsunday in the church of St. Mary Le Beau. Compton, cruelly mortified, refused to bear any part in the ceremony. His place was supplied by Mew, Bishop of Winchester, who was assisted by Burnet, Stillingfleet, and Howe. 
The congregation was the most splendid that had been seen in any place of worship since the coronation. The queen's drawing room was on that day deserted. Most of the peers who were in town met in the morning at Bedford House and went thence in procession to Cheapside. Norfolk, Caremartin, and Dorset were conspicuous in the throng. Devonshire, who was impatient to see his woods at Chatsworth in their summer beauty, had deferred his departure in order to mark his respect for Tillotson. The crowd which lined the streets greeted the new primate warmly, for he had, during many years, preached in the city, and his eloquence, his probity, and the singular gentleness of his temper and manners had made him the favorite of the Londoners. But the congratulations and applauses of his friends could not drown the roar of execration which the Jacobites set up. According to them, he was a thief who had not entered by the door, but had climbed over the fences. He was a hireling whose own the sheep were not, who had usurped the crook of the good shepherd, and who might well be expected to leave the flock at the mercy of every wolf. He was an Arian, a Socinian, a deist, an atheist. He had caused in the world by fine phrases and by a show of moral goodness. But he was in truth a far more dangerous enemy of the church than he could have been if he had openly proclaimed himself a disciple of Hobbes and had lived as loosely as Wilmot. He had taught the fine gentlemen and ladies who admired his style and who were constantly seen round his pulpit that they might be very good Christians and yet might believe the account of the fall in the book of Genesis to be allegorical. Indeed, they might easily be as good Christians as he, for he had never been christened. His parents were Anabaptists. He had lost their religion when he was a boy, and he had never found another. In ribald lampoons, he was nicknamed Undipped John. The parish register of his baptism was produced in vain. His enemies still continued to complain that they had lived to see fathers of the church who were never her children. They made up a story that the queen had felt bitter remorse for the great crime by which she had obtained a throne, that in her agony she had applied to Tillotson and that he had comforted her by assuring her that the punishment of the wicked in a future state would not be eternal. The archbishop's mind was, naturally, of almost feminine delicacy and had been rather softened than braced by the habits of a long life, during which contending sects and factions had agreed in speaking of his abilities with admiration, and of his character with esteem. The storm of obloquy which he had to face for the first time at more than sixty years of age was too much for him. His spirits declined, his health gave way, yet he neither flinched from his duty nor attempted to revenge himself on his persecutors. A few days after his consecration, some persons were seized while dispersing libels in which he was reviled. The law officers of the crown proposed to institute prosecutions, but he insisted that nobody should be punished on his account. Once, when he had company with him, a sealed packet was put into his hands. He opened it, and out fell a mask. His friends were shocked and incensed by this cowardly insult, but the archbishop, trying to conceal his anguish by a smile, pointed to the pamphlets which covered his table, and said that the reproach which the emblem of the mask was intended to convey might be called gentle when compared with other reproaches which he daily had to endure. After his death, a bundle of the savage lampoons which the non-jurors had circulated against him was found among his papers with this endorsement, I pray God forgive them. I do. The temper of the deposed primate was very different. He seemed to have been under a complete delusion as to his own importance. The immense popularity which he had enjoyed three years before, the prayers and tears of the multitudes who had plunged into the Thames to implore his blessing, the enthusiasm with which the sentinels of the tower had drunk his health under the windows of his prison, the mighty roar of joy which had risen from Palace Yard on the morning of his acquittal the triumphant night when every window from Hyde Park to Mile End had exhibited seven candles, the midmost and tallest emblematical of him, were still fresh in his recollection. Nor had he the wisdom to perceive that all this homage had been paid not to his person, but to that religion and to those liberties of which he was for a moment the representative. The extreme tenderness with which the new government had long persisted in treating him seems to have confirmed him in his error. That a succession of conciliatory messages was sent to him from Kensington, that he was offered terms so liberal as to be scarcely consistent with the dignity of the crown and the welfare of the state, 
that his cold and uncourteous answers could not tire out the royal indulgence, that, in spite of the loud clamors of the Whigs and of the provocations daily given by the Jacobites, he was residing fifteen months after deprivation in the Metropolitan Palace. These things seemed to him to indicate not the leniency but the timidity of the ruling powers. He appears to have flattered himself that they would not dare to eject him. The news, therefore, that his see had been filled threw him into a passion which lasted as long as his life and which hurried him into many foolish and unseemly actions. Tillotson, as soon as he was appointed, went to Lambeth in the hope that he might be able, by courtesy and kindness, to soothe the irritation of which he was the innocent cause. He stayed long in the antechamber and sent in his name by several servants. But Sancroft would not even return an answer. Three weeks passed, and still the deprived archbishop showed no disposition to move. At length he received an order intimating to him the royal pleasure that he should quit the dwelling which had long ceased to be his own, and in which he was only a guest. He resented this order bitterly, and declared that he would not obey it. He would stay till he was pulled out by the sheriff's officers. He would defend himself at law as long as he could do so, without putting in any plea acknowledging the authority of the usurpers. The case was so clear that he could not, by any artifice of chicanery, obtain more than a short delay. When judgment had been given against him, he left the palace but directed his servant to retain possession. The consequence was that the steward was taken into custody and heavily fined. Tillotson sent a kind message to assure his predecessor that the fine should not be exacted, but Sancroft was determined to have a grievance and would pay the money. From that time, the great object of the narrow-minded and peevish old man was to tear in pieces the church of which he had been the chief minister. It was in vain that some of those non-jurors whose virtue, ability, and learning were the glory of their party remonstrated against his design. Our deprivation, was the reasoning of Ken, is in the sight of God a nullity. We are and shall be till we die or resign the true bishops of our sees. Those who assume our titles and functions will incur the guilt of schism. But with us, if we act as becomes us, the schism will die, and in the next generation the unity of the church will be restored. On the other hand, if we consecrate bishops to succeed us, the breach may last through ages, and we shall be justly held accountable, not indeed for its origin, but for its continuance. These considerations ought, on St. Cross's own principles, to have had decisive weight with him, but his angry passions prevailed. Ken quietly retired from the venerable palace of Wells. He had done, he said, with strife, and should henceforth vent his feelings not in disputes, but in hymns. His charities to the unhappy of all persuasions, especially to the followers of Monmouth and to the persecuted Huguenots, had been so large that his whole private fortune consisted of seven hundred pounds, and of a library which he could not bear to sell. But Thomas Thin, Viscount Weymouth, though not a non-juror, did himself honor by offering to the most virtuous of the non-jurors a tranquil and dignified asylum in the princely mansion of Longleat. There Ken passed a happy and honored old age, during which he never regretted the sacrifice which he had made to what he thought his duty and yet constantly became more and more indulgent to those whose views of duty differed from his. Sandcroft was of a very different temper. He had indeed as little to complain of as any man whom a revolution has ever hurled down from an exalted station. He had at Fressingfield, in Suffolk, a patrimonial estate, which, together with what he had saved during a primacy of twelve years, enabled him to live, not indeed as he had lived when he was the first peer of Parliament, but in the style of an opulent country gentleman. He retired to his hereditary abode, and there he passed the rest of his life in brooding over his wrongs. Aversion to the established church became as strong a feeling in him as it had been in Martin Marpolate. He considered all who remained in communion with her as heathens and publicans. He nicknamed Tillotson the Mufti. 
In the room which was used as a chapel at Fresingfield, no person who had taken the oaths or who had attended the ministry of any divine who had taken the oaths was suffered to partake of the sacred bread and wine. A distinction, however, was made between two classes of offenders. A layman who remained in communion with the church was permitted to be present while prayers were read and was excluded only from the highest of the Christian mysteries. But with clergymen who had sworn allegiance to the sovereigns in possession, Sancroft would not even pray. He took care that the rule which he had laid down should be widely known, and both by precept and by example taught his followers to look on the most orthodox, the most devout, the most virtuous of those who acknowledged William's authority with a feeling similar to that with which the Jew regarded the Samaritan. Such intolerance would have been reprehensible, even in a man contending for a great principle. But Sancroft was contending merely for a name. He was the author of the scheme of regency. He was perfectly willing to transfer the whole kingly power from James to William, the question which, to the smallest and sourest of minds, seemed important enough to justify the excommunicating of ten thousand priests and of five millions of laymen, was whether the magistrate to whom the whole kingly power was transferred should assume the kingly title. Nor could Sancroft bear to think that the animosity which he had excited would die with himself. Having done all that he could to make the feud bitter, he determined to make it eternal. A list of the divines who had been ejected from their benefices was sent by him to St. Germain with the request that James would nominate two who might keep up the Episcopal succession. James, well pleased, doubtless, to see another sect added to that multitude of sects which he had been taught to consider as the reproach of Protestantism, named two fierce and uncompromising non-jurors, Hicks and Wagstaff, the former recommended by Sancroft, the latter recommended by Lloyd, the ejected Bishop of Norwich. Such was the origin of a schismatical hierarchy, which, having during a short time excited alarm, soon sank into obscurity and contempt but which, in obscurity and contempt, continued to drag on a languid existence during several generations. The little church, without temples, revenues, or dignities, was even more distracted by internal disputes than the great church, which retained possession of cathedrals, tithes, and peerages. Some non-jurors leaned toward the ceremonial of Rome. Others would not tolerate the slightest departure from the Book of Common Prayer. Altar was set up against altar. One phantom prelate pronounced the consecration of another phantom prelate uncanonical. At length, the pastors were left absolutely without flocks. One of these lords spiritual very wisely turned surgeon. Another left what he had called his see and settled in Ireland. And at length, in 1805, the last bishop of that society, which had proudly claimed to be the only true church of England, dropped unnoticed into the grave. The places of the bishops who had been ejected with Sancroft were filled in a manner creditable to the government. Patrick succeeded the traitor Turner, Fowler went to Gloucester, Richard Cumberland, an aged divine who had no interest at court and whose only recommendations were his piety and erudition, was astonished by learning from a newsletter which he had found on the table of a coffee house that he had been nominated to the see of Peterborough. Beveridge was selected to succeed Ken. He consented and the appointment was actually announced in the London Gazette. But Beveridge, though an honest, was not a strong-minded man. Some Jacobites expostulated with him, some reviled him. His heart failed him, and he retracted. While the non-jurors were rejoicing in this victory, he changed his mind again, but too late. He had by his irresolution forfeited the favor of William and never obtained a meter till Anne was on the throne. The bishopric of Bath and Wells was bestowed on Richard Kidder, a man of considerable attainments and blameless character, but suspected of leaning towards Presbyterianism. About the same time, Sharp, the highest churchman that had been zealous for the comprehension and the lowest churchman that felt a scruple about succeeding a deprived prelate, accepted the archbishopric of York, vacant by the death of Lamplug. In consequence of the elevation of Tillotson to the See of Canterbury, the deanery of St. Paul's became vacant. As soon as the name of the new dean was known, a clamor broke forth such as perhaps no ecclesiastical appointment has ever produced, a clamor made up of yells of hatred, of hisses of contempt, and of shouts of triumph, and half-insulting welcome, for the new dean was William Sherlock. 
The story of his conversion deserves to be fully told, for it throws great light on the character of the parties which then divided the church and the state. Sherlock was, in influence and reputation, though not in rank, the foremost man among the non-jurors. His authority and example had induced some of his brethren, who had at first wavered, to resign their benefices. The day of the suspension came, the day of the deprivation came, and still he was firm. He seemed to have found, in the consciousness of rectitude, and in meditation on the invisible world, ample compensation for all his losses. While excluded from the pulpit, where his eloquence had once delighted the learned and polite inmates of the temple, he wrote that celebrated Treatise on Death, which during many years stood next to the whole duty of man in the bookcases of serious Arminians. Soon, however, it began to be suspected that his resolution was giving way. He declared that he would be no party to a schism. He advised those who sought his counsel not to leave their parish churches, nay, finding that the law which had ejected him from his cure did not interdict him from performing divine service, he officiated at St. Dustin's, and there prayed for King William and Queen Mary. The apostolical injunction, he said, was that prayer should be made for all in authority, and William and Mary were visibly in authority. His Jacobite friends loudly blamed his inconsistency. How, they asked, if you admit that the Apostle speaks in this passage of actual authority, can you maintain that in other passages of a similar kind he speaks only of legitimate authority? Or how can you, without sin, designate as king, in a solemn address to God, one whom you cannot, without sin, promise to obey as king? These reasonings were unanswerable, and Sherlock soon began to think them so. But the conclusion to which they led him was diametrically opposed to the conclusion to which they were meant to lead him. He hesitated, however, till a new light flashed on his mind from a quarter from which there was little reason to expect anything but tenfold darkness. In the reign of James I, Dr. John Overall, Bishop of Exeter, had written an elaborate treatise on the rights of civil and ecclesiastical governors. This treatise had been solemnly approved by the Convocations of Canterbury and York, and might therefore be considered as an authoritative exposition of the doctrine of the Church of England. A copy of the manuscript was in Sancroft's possession, and he, soon after the Revolution, sent it to the press. He hoped, doubtless, that the publication would injure the new government. But he was lamentably disappointed. The book indeed condemned all resistance in terms as strong as he himself could have used. But one passage which had escaped his notice was decisive against himself and his fellow schismatics. Overall, and the two convocations which had given their sanction to Overall's teaching, pronounced that a government, which had originated in rebellion, ought, when thoroughly settled, to be considered as ordained by God and to be obeyed by Christian men. Sherlock read and was convinced. His venerable mother, the Church, had spoken, and he, with the docility of a child, accepted her decree. The government which had sprung from the revolution might, at least since the Battle of the Boyne and the flight of James from Ireland, be fairly called a settled government, and ought therefore to be passively obeyed till it should be subverted by another revolution and succeeded by another settled government. End of section four. Recording by S. T. Macduff. Section 5 of Chapter 17 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 5. Sherlock took the oaths and speedily published, in justification of his conduct, a pamphlet entitled The Case of Allegiance to Sovereign Powers Stated. The sensation produced by this work was immense. Dryden's Hind and Panther had not raised so great an uproar. Halifax's letter to a dissenter had not called forth so many answers. The replies to the doctor, the vindications of the doctor, the pasquinades on the doctor would fill a library. The clamour redoubled when it was known that the convert had not only been reappointed master of the temple, but had accepted the deanery of St. Paul's which had become vacant in consequence of the deprivation of Sancroft and the promotion of Tilliston. The rage of the non-jurors amounted almost to frenzy. 
Was it not enough, they asked, to desert the true and pure church, in this her hour of sorrow and peril, without also slandering her? It was easy to understand why a greedy, cowardly hypocrite should refuse to take the oath to the usurper, as long as it seemed probable that the rightful king would be restored, and should make haste to swear after the battle of the Boyne. Such tergiversation in times of civil discord was nothing new. What was new was that the turncoat should try to throw his own guilt and shame on the Church of England, and should proclaim that she had taught him to turn against the weak who were in the right, and to cringe to the powerful who were in the wrong. Had such indeed been her doctrine or her practice in evil days? Had she abandoned her royal martyr in the prison or on the scaffold? Had she enjoined her children to pay obedience to the rump or to the protector? Yet was the government of the rump or the protector less entitled to be called a settled government than the government of William and Mary? Had not the Battle of Westetter been as great a blow to the hopes of the House of Stuart as the Battle of Boyne? Had not chances of a restoration seemed as small in 1657 as they could seem to any judicious man in 1691? In spite of invectives and sarcasms, however, there was overall's treatise. There was the approving voices of the two convocations, and it was much easier to rail at Sherlock than to explain away either the treatise or the votes. One writer maintained that by a thoroughly settled government must have been meant a government of which the title was uncontested. Thus, he said, the government of the United Provinces became a settled government when it was recognised by Spain, and but for that recognition would never have been a settled government to the end of time. Another casuist, somewhat less austere, pronounced that a government wrongful in its origin might become a settled government after the lapse of a century. On the 13th of February, 1789, therefore, and not a day earlier, Englishmen would be at liberty to swear allegiance to a government sprung from the Revolution. The history of the chosen people was ransacked for precedence. Was Eglon's a settled government when Eyud stabbed him? Was Joran's a settled government when Jehu shot him? But the leading case was that of Athaliah. It was indeed a case which furnished the malcontents with many happy and pungent allusions. A kingdom treacherously seized by a usurper near in blood to the throne. The rightful prince long dispossessed. A part of the sacerdotal order true through many disastrous years to the royal house. A counter-revolution at length effected by the high priest at the head of the Levites. Who, it was asked, would dare to blame the heroic pontiff who had restored the heir of David? Yet was not the government of Athaliah as firmly settled as that of the Prince of Orange? Hundreds of pages written at this time about the rights of Joash and the bold enterprise of Jehodia are mouldering in the ancient bookcases of Oxford and Cambridge. While Sherlock was thus fiercely attacked by his old friends, he was not left unmolested by his old enemies. Some vehement Whigs, amongst whom Julian Johnson was conspicuous, declared that Jacobitism itself was respectable when compared with the vile doctrine which had been discovered in the Convocation Book. That passive obedience was due to kings was doubtless an absurd and pernicious notion, yet it was impossible not to respect the consistency and fortitude of men who thought themselves bound to bear true allegiance at all hazard to an unfortunate, a deposed and exiled oppressor. But the theory which Sherlock had learnt from overall was unmixed baseness and wickedness. A cause was to be abandoned, not because it was unjust, but because it was unprosperous. Whether James had been a tyrant or had been the father of his people was quite immaterial. If he had won the Battle of the Boyne, we should have been bound as Christians to be his slaves. He had lost it, and we were bound as Christians to be his foes. Other Whigs congratulated the proselyte on having come, by whatever road, to the right practical conclusion, but could not refrain from sneering at the history which he gave of his conversion. He was, they said, a man of eminent learning and abilities. He had studied the question of allegiance long and deeply. He had written much about it. 
Several months had been allowed to him for reading, prayer, and reflection before he incurred suspension. Several months more before he incurred deprivation. He had formed an opinion for which he had declared himself ready to suffer martyrdom. He had taught that opinion to others, and he had then changed that opinion solely because he discovered that it had been, not refuted, but dogmatically pronounced erroneous by the two convocations more than eighty years before. Surely this was to renounce all liberty of private judgment, and to ascribe to the synods of Canterbury and York an infallibility which the Church of England had declared that even ecumenic councils could not justly claim. If, it was sarcastically said, all our notions of right and wrong, in matters of vital importance to the well-being of society, are to be suddenly altered by a few lines of manuscript found in the corner of the library at Lambeth, it is surely much to be wished for the peace of mind of humble Christians that all the documents to which this sort of authority belongs should be rummaged out and sent to the press as soon as possible. For unless this be done, we may all, like the doctor when he refused the oath last year, be committing sins in the full persuasion that we are discharging duties. In truth, it is not easy to believe that the convocation book furnished Sherlock with anything more than a pretext for doing what he had made his mind to do. The united force of reason and interest had doubtless convinced him that his passions and prejudices had led him to a great error. That error he determined to recant, and it cost him less to say that his opinion had been changed by newly discovered evidence than that he had formed a wrong judgment with all the materials for the forming of a right judgment before him. The popular belief was that his retraction was the effect of the tears, explanations, and reproaches of his wife. The lady's spirit was high, her authority in the family was great, and she cared much more about her house and her carriage, the plenty of her table, and the prospects of her children, than about the patriarchal origin of government, or the meaning of the word abdication. She had, it was asserted, given her husband no peace by day or night until he had got over his scruples. In letters, fables, songs, dialogues without number, her powers of seduction and intimidation were malignantly extolled. She was Xanthippe, pouring water on the head of Socrates. She was Delilah shearing Samson. She was Eve, forcing the forbidden fruit into Adam's mouth. She was Job's wife, imploring her ruined lord, who sat scraping himself among the ashes, not to curse and die, but to swear and live. While the ballad-makers celebrated the victory of Mrs. Sherlock, another class of assailants fell on the theological reputation of her spouse. Till he took the oaths, he had always been considered as the most orthodox of divines. But the captitious and malignant criticism to which his writings were now subjected would have found heresy in the Sermon on the Mount and he, unfortunately, was rash enough to publish, at the very moment when the outcry against his political tergiversation was loudest, his thoughts on the mystery of the Trinity. It is probable that at another time his work would have been hailed by good churchmen as a triumphant answer to the Socinians and Sabellians. But unhappily in his zeal against Socinians and Sabellians, he used expressions which might be construed into tritheism, Candid judges would have remembered that the true path was closely pressed on the right and the left by error, and that it was scarcely possible to keep far enough from danger on one side without going very close to danger on the other. But candid judges Sherlock was not likely to find among the Jacobites. His old allies affirmed that he had incurred all those fearful penalties denounced in the Athanasian Creed against those who divide the substance. Bulky quartos were written to prove that he had held the existence of three distinct deities, and some facetious malcontents, who troubled themselves very little about the Catholic verity, amused the town by lampoons in English and Latin on his heterodoxy. We, said one of these jesters, plight our faith to one king and call one god to attest our promise. We cannot think it strange that there should be more than one king to whom the doctor has sworn allegiance when we consider the doctor has more gods than one to swear by. 
Sherlock would perhaps have doubted whether the government to which he had submitted was entitled to be called the settled government, if he had known all the dangers by which it was threatened. Scarcely had Preston's plot been detected when a new plot of a very different kind was formed in the camp, in the navy, in the treasury, in the very bed chamber of the king. This mystery of iniquity has, through five generations, been gradually unveiling, but it is not yet entirely unveiled. Some parts which are still obscure may possibly, by the discovery of letters or diaries now reposing under the dust of a century and a half, be made clear to our posterity. The materials, however, which are at present accessible, are sufficient for the construction of a narrative not to be read without shame and loathing. We have seen that, in the spring of 1690, Shrewsbury, irritated by finding his counsels rejected, and those of his Tory rivals followed, suffered himself in a fatal hour to be drawn into a correspondence with the banished family. We have seen also by what cruel sufferings of body and mind he expiated his fault. Tortured by remorse, and by disease the effect of remorse, he had quitted the court, but he had left behind him men whose principles were not less lax than his, and whose hearts were far harder and colder. Early in 1691, some of these men began to hold secret communication with Saint-Germain. Wicked and base as their conduct was, there was in it nothing surprising. They did after their kind. The times were troubled. A thick cloud was upon the future. The most sagacious and experienced politician could not see with any clearness three months before him. To a man of virtue and honour, indeed, this mattered little. His uncertainty as to what the morrow might bring forth might make him anxious, but could not make him perfidious. Though left in utter darkness as to what concerned his interests, he had the sure guidance of his principles. But, unhappily, men of virtue and honour were not numerous among the courtiers of that age. Whitehall had been, during thirty years, a seminary of every public and private vice, and swarmed with low-minded, double-dealing, self-seeking politicians. These politicians now acted as was natural that men profoundly immoral should act in a crisis of which none could predict the issue. Some of them might have had a slight predilection for William, others a slight predilection for James, but it was not by any such predilection that the conduct of any of the breed was guided. If it had seemed certain that William would stand, they would have all been for William. If it had seemed certain that James would be restored, they would all have been for James. But what was to be done when the chances appeared to be almost exactly balanced? There were honest men of one party who could have answered, to stand by the true king and the true church, and if necessary to die for them, like Lord. There were honest men of the other party who would have answered, to stand by the liberties of England and the Protestant religion, and if necessary to die for them, like Sydney. But such consistency was unintelligible to many of the noble and the powerful. Their object was to be safe in every event. They therefore openly took the oath of allegiance to one king, and obtaining commissions, patents of peerage, pensions, grants of crown land under the seal of William, and they had in their secret drawers promises of pardon in the handwriting of James. Among those who were guilty of this wickedness, three men stand pre-eminent, Russell, Godolphin, and Marlborough. No three men could be in head and heart more unlike to one another, and the peculiar qualities of each gave a peculiar character to his villainy. The treason of Russell is to be attributed partly to factitiousness. The treason of Godolphin is to be attributed altogether to timidity. The treason of Marlborough was the treason of a man of great genius and boundless ambition. It may be thought strange that Russell should have been out of humour. He had just accepted the command of the United Naval Forces of England and Holland, with the rank of Admiral of the Fleet. He was Treasurer of the Navy. He had a pension of £3,000 a year. Crown property and its showing cost to the value of £18,000 had been bestowed on him. His indirect gains must have been immense, but he was still dissatisfied. In truth, with undaunted carriage, with considerable talents for both for war and for administration, and with a certain public spirit, which showed itself by glimpses even in the very worst parts of his life, 
He is emphatically a bad man. Insolent, malignant, greedy, faithless. He conceived that the great services which he had performed at the time of the revolution had not been adequately rewarded. Everything that was given to others seemed to him to be pillaged from himself. A letter is still extant which he wrote to William about this time. It is made up of boasts, reproaches, and sneers. The Admiral, with ironical professions of humility and loyalty, begins by asking permission to put his wrongs on paper, because his bashfulness would not suffer him to explain himself by words of mouth. His grievances were intolerable. Other people got grants of royal domains, but he could get scarcely anything. Other people could provide for their dependents, but his recommendations were uniformly disregarded. The income which he derived from the royal favour might seem large, but he had poor relations, and the government, instead of doing its duty by them, had most unhandsomely left them to his care. He had a sister who ought to have a pension, for without one she could not give portions to her daughters. He had a brother, who for want of a place had been reduced to the melancholy necessity of marrying an old woman for her money. Russell proceeded to complain bitterly that the Whigs were neglected, that the revolution had aggrandized and enriched men who had made the greatest efforts to avert it. And there is reason to believe that this complaint came from his heart. For next to his own interests, those of his party were dearest to him. Even when he was most inclined to become a Jacobite, he never had the smallest disposition to become a Tory. In the temper which this letter indicates, he readily listened to the suggestions of David Lloyd, one of the ablest and most active emissaries who at this time were constantly plying between France and England. Lloyd conveyed to James assurances that Russell would, when a favourable opportunity should present itself, try to effect by means of the fleet what Monk had effected in the preceding generation by means of the army. To what extent these assurances were sincere was a question about which men who knew Russell well, and who were minutely informed as to his conduct, were in doubt. It seems probable that during many months he did not know his own mind. His interest was to stand well as long as possible with both kings. His irritable and imperious nature was constantly impelling him to quarrel with both. His spleen was excited one week by a dry answer from William, and the next week by an absurd proclamation from James. Fortunately, the most important day of his life, the day from which all his subsequent years took their colour, found him out of temper with the banished king. Godolphin had not, and did not pretend to have any cause of complaint against the government which he served. He was first commissioner of the treasury. He had been protected, trusted, caressed. Indeed, the favour shown to him had excited many murmurs. Was it fitting, the Whigs had indignantly asked, that a man who had been high in office for the whole of the late reign, who had promised to vote for the indulgence, who had sat in the privy council with a Jesuit, who had sat at the board of treasury with two papists, who had an attendant and idolatrous to her altar, should be among the chief ministers of a prince whose title to the throne was derived from the Declaration of Rights. But on William this clamour had produced no effect, and none of his English servants seemed to have had at this time a larger share of his confidence than Godolphin. End of section 5 Section 6 of Chapter 17 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill McGovern. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 6. Nevertheless, the Jacobites did not despair. One of the most zealous among them, a gentleman named Bulkley, who had formerly been on terms of intimacy with Godolphin, undertook to see what could be done. He called at the treasury and tried to draw the first lord into political talk. This was no easy matter, for Godolphin was not a man to put himself lightly into the power of others. His reserve was proverbial and he was especially renowned for the dexterity with which he, through life, turned conversation away from matters of state 
to a mane of cocks or the pedigree of a racehorse. The visit ended without his uttering a word, indicating that he remembered the existence of King James. Bulkley, however, was not to be so repulsed. He came again and introduced the subject which was nearest his heart. Godolphin then asked after his old master and mistress in the mournful tone of a man who despaired of ever being reconciled to them. Bulkley assured him that King James was ready to forgive all the past. May I tell His Majesty that you will try to deserve his favor? At this Godolphin rose, said something about the trammels of office and his wish to be released from them, and put an end to the interview. Bulkley soon made a third attempt. By this time Godolphin had learned some things which shook his confidence in the stability of the government which he had served. He began to think, as he would himself have expressed it, that he had betted too deep on the revolution, and that it was time to hedge. Evasions would no longer serve his turn. It was necessary to speak out. He spoke out, and declared himself a devoted servant of King James. I shall take an early opportunity of resigning my place, but till then I am under a tie. I must not betray my trust. To enhance the value of the sacrifice which he proposed to make, he produced a most friendly and confidential letter which he had lately received from William. You see how entirely the Prince of Orange trusts me. He tells me that he cannot do without me, and that there is no Englishman for whom he has so great a kindness. But all this weighs nothing with me in comparison to my duty to my lawful king. If the First Lord of the Treasury really had scruples about betraying his trust, those scruples were soon so effectually removed that he very complacently continued during six years to eat the bread of one master while secretly sending professions of attachment and promises of service to another. The truth is that Godolphin was under the influence of a mind far more powerful and far more depraved than his own. His perplexities had been imparted to Marlborough, to whom he had long been bound by such friendship as two very unprincipled men are capable of feeling for each other, and to whom he was afterwards bound by close domestic ties. Marlborough was in a very different situation from that of William's other servants. Lloyd might make overtures to Russell and Bulkley to Godolphin, but all the agents of the banished court stood aloof from the traitor of Salisbury. That shameful night seemed to have forever separated the perjured deserter from the prince whom he had ruined. James had, even in the last extremity, when his army was in full retreat, when his whole kingdom had risen against him, declared that he would never pardon Churchill, never, never. By all the Jacobites, the name of Churchill was held in peculiar abhorrence, and, in the prose and verse which came forth daily from their secret presses, a precedence in infamy among all the many traitors of the age was assigned to him. In the order of things which had sprung from the revolution, he was one of the great men of England, high in the state, high in the army. He had been created an earl. He had a large share in the military administration. The emoluments, direct and indirect, of the places and commands which he held under the crown were believed at the Dutch embassy to amount to twelve thousand pounds a year. In the event of a counter-revolution, it seemed that he had nothing in prospect but a garret in Holland, or a scaffold on Tower Hill. It might, therefore, have been expected that he would serve his new master with fidelity, not indeed with the fidelity of Nottingham, which was the fidelity of conscientiousness, not with the fidelity of Portland, which was the fidelity of affection, but with the not less stubborn fidelity of despair. Those who thought thus knew but little of Marlborough. Confident in his own powers of deception, he resolved, since the Jacobite agents would not seek him, to seek them. He therefore sent to beg an interview with Colonel Edward Sackville. Sackville was astonished and not much pleased by the message. He was a sturdy cavalier of the old school. He had been persecuted in the days of the Popish plot for manfully saying what he thought, and what everybody now thinks about Oates and Bedloe. Since the Revolution... 
He had put his neck in peril for King James, had been chased by officers with warrants, and had been designated as a traitor in a proclamation to which Marlborough himself had been a party. It was not without reluctance that the staunch royalist crossed the hated threshold of the deserter. He was repaid for his effort by the edifying spectacle of such an agony of repentance as he had never before seen. Will you, said Marlborough, be my intercessor with the king? Will you tell him what I suffer? My crimes now appear to me in their true light, and I shrink with horror from the contemplation. The thought of them is with me day and night. I sit down to table, but I cannot eat. I throw myself on my bed, but I cannot sleep. I am ready to sacrifice everything, to brave everything, to bring utter ruin on my fortunes, if only I may be free from the misery of a wounded spirit. If appearances could be trusted, this great offender was as true a penitent as David or as Peter. Sackville reported to his friends what had passed. They could not but acknowledge that, if the arch-traitor, who had hitherto opposed to conscience and to public opinion the same cool and placid hardihood which distinguished him on the fields of battle, had really begun to feel remorse, it would be absurd to reject, on account of his unworthiness, the inestimable services which it was in his power to render to the good cause. He sat in the interior council. He held high command in the army. He had been recently entrusted, and would doubtless again be entrusted, with the direction of important military operations. It was true that no man had incurred equal guilt, but it was true also that no man had it in his power to make equal reparation. If he was sincere, he might doubtless earn the pardon which he so much desired. But was he sincere? Had he not been just as loud in professions of loyalty on the very eve of his crime? It was necessary to put him to the test. Several tests were applied by Sackville and Lloyd. Marlborough was required to furnish full information touching the strength and distribution of all the divisions of the English army, and he complied. He was required to disclose the whole plan of the approaching campaign, and he did so. The Jacobite leaders watched carefully for inaccuracies in his reports, but could find none. It was thought a still stronger proof of his fidelity that he gave valuable intelligence about what he was doing in the office of the Secretary of State. A deposition had been sworn against one zealous royalist. A warrant was preparing against another. These intimations saved several of the malcontents from imprisonment, if not from the gallows and it was impossible for them not to feel some relenting towards the awakened sinner to whom they owed so much. He, however, in his secret conversations with his new allies, laid no claim to merit. He did not, he said, ask for confidence. How could he, after the villainies which he had committed against the best of kings, hope ever to be trusted again? It was enough for a wretch like him to be permitted to make, at the cost of his life, some poor atonement to the gracious master, whom he had indeed basely injured, but whom he had never ceased to love. It was not improbable that, in the summer, he might command the English forces in Flanders. Was it wished that he should bring them over in a body to the French camp? If such were the royal pleasure, he would undertake that the thing should be done. But on the whole, he thought that it would be better to wait till the next session of Parliament, and then he hinted at a plan, which he afterwards more fully matured, for expelling the usurper by means of the English legislature and the English army. In the meantime, he hoped that James would command Godolphin not to quit the treasury. A private man could do little for the good cause. One who was the director of national finances and the depository of the gravest secrets of state might render inestimable services. Marlborough's pretended repentance imposed so completely on those who managed the affairs of James in London that they sent Lloyd to France with the cheering intelligence that the most depraved of all rebels had been wonderfully transformed into a loyal subject. The tidings filled James with delight and hope. Had he been wise, they would have excited in him only aversion and distrust. It was absurd to imagine that a man really heartbroken 
by remorse and shame for one act of perfidy would determine to lighten his conscience by committing a second act of perfidy as odious and as disgraceful as the first. The promised atonement was so wicked and base that it never could be made by any man sincerely desirous to atone for past wickedness and baseness. The truth was that, when Marlborough told the Jacobites that his sense of guilt prevented him from swallowing his food by day or taking his rest at night, he was laughing at them. The loss of half a guinea would have done more to spoil his appetite and to disturb his slumbers than all the terrors of an evil conscience. What his offers really proved was that his former crime had sprung not from an ill-regulated zeal for the interests of his country and his religion, but from a deep and incurable moral disease which had infected the whole man. James, however, partly from dullness and partly from selfishness, could never see any immorality in any action by which he was benefited. To conspire against him, to betray him, to break an oath of allegiance sworn to him, were crimes for which no punishment here or hereafter could be too severe. But to murder his enemies, to break faith with his enemies, was not only innocent but laudable. The desertion at Salisbury had been the worst of crimes, for it had ruined him. A similar desertion in Flanders would be an honorable exploit, for it might restore him. The penitent was informed by his Jacobite friends that he was forgiven. The news was most welcome, but something more was necessary to restore his lost peace of mind. Might he hope to have, in the royal handwriting, two lines containing a promise of pardon? It was not, of course, for his own sake that he asked this, but he was confident that with such a document in his hands he could bring back to the right path some persons of great note who adhered to the usurper, only because they imagined that they had no mercy to expect from the legitimate king. They would return to their duty as soon as they saw that even the worst of all criminals had, on his repentance, been generously forgiven. The promise was written, sent, and carefully treasured up. Marlborough had now attained one object, an object which was common to him with Russell and Godolphin. But he had other objects which neither Russell nor Godolphin had ever contemplated. There is, as we shall hereafter see, strong reason to believe that this wise, brave, wicked man was meditating a plan worthy of his fertile intellect and daring spirit, and not less worthy of his deeply corrupted heart, a plan which, if it had not been frustrated by strange means, would have ruined William without benefiting James, and would have made the successful traitor master of England and arbiter of Europe. Thus things stood when, in May 1691, William, after a short and busy sojourn in England, set out again for the continent, where the regular campaign was about to open. He took with him Marlborough, whose abilities he justly appreciated, and whose recent negotiations with Saint-Germain he had not the faintest suspicion. At The Hague several important military and political consultations were held, and on every occasion the superiority of the accomplished Englishman was felt by the most distinguished soldiers and statesmen of the United Provinces. Heinzius, long after, used to relate a conversation which took place at this time between William and the Prince of Vaudemont, one of the ablest commanders in the Dutch service. Vaudemont spoke well of several English officers, and among them of Talmash and Mackay, but pronounced Marlborough superior beyond comparison to the rest. He has every quality of a general. His very look shows it. He cannot fail to achieve something great. I really believe, cousin, answered the king, that my lord will make good everything you have said of him. There was still a short interval before the commencement of military operations. William passed that interval in his beloved park at Loo. Marlborough spent two or three days there and was then dispatched to Flanders with orders to collect all the English forces to form a camp in the neighborhood of Brussels and to have everything in readiness for the king's arrival. And now Marlborough had an opportunity of proving the sincerity of those professions by which he had obtained from a heart 
well described by himself as harder than a marble chimney-piece, the pardon of an offence such as might have moved even a gentle nature to deadly resentment. He received from Saint-Germain a message claiming the instant performance of his promise to desert at the head of his troops. He was told that this was the greatest service which he could render to the crown. His word was pledged, and the gracious master, who had forgiven all past errors, confidently expected that it would be redeemed. The hypocrite evaded the demand with characteristic dexterity. In the most respectful and affectionate language he excused himself for not immediately obeying the royal commands. The promise which he was required to fulfill had not been quite correctly understood. There had been some misapprehension on the part of the messengers. To carry over a regiment or two would do more harm than good. To carry over a whole army was a business which would require much time and management. While James was murmuring over these apologies and wishing he had not been quite so placable, William arrived at the headquarters of the Allied forces and took the chief command. The military operations in Flanders recommenced early in June and terminated at the close of September. No important action took place. The two armies marched and countermarched, drew near and receded. During some time they confronted each other with less than a league between them. But neither William nor Luxembourg would fight except at an advantage, and neither gave the other any advantage. Languid as the campaign was, it is on one account remarkable. During more than a century our country had sent no great force to make war by land out of the British Isles. Our aristocracy had therefore long ceased to be a military class. The nobles of France, of Germany, of Holland were generally soldiers. It would probably have been difficult to find in the brilliant circle which surrounded Louis at Versailles a single Marcus or Viscount of forty who had not been at some battle or siege. But the immense majority of our peers, baronets, and opulent esquires had never served except in the train bands and had never borne a part in any military exploit more serious than that of putting down a riot or of keeping a street clear for a procession. The generation which had fought at Edge Hill and Lansdowne had nearly passed away, the wars of Charles II had been almost entirely maritime. During his reign, therefore, the sea service had been decidedly more the mode than the land service, and repeatedly, when our fleet sailed to encounter the Dutch, such multitudes of men of fashion had gone on board that the parks and the theatres had been left desolate. In 1691, at length, for the first time since Henry VIII laid siege to Bologna, an English army appeared on the continent under the command of an English king. A camp, which was also a court, was irresistibly attractive to many young patricians, full of natural intrepidity and ambitious of the favor which men of distinguished bravery always found in the eyes of women. To volunteer for Flanders became the rage among the fine gentlemen who combed their flowing wigs and exchanged their richly perfumed snuffs at the St. James Coffee House. William's headquarters were enlivened by a crowd of splendid equipages and by a rapid succession of sumptuous banquets. For among the high-born and high-spirited youths who repaired to his standard were some who, though quite willing to face a battery, were not at all disposed to deny themselves the luxuries with which they had been surrounded in Soho Square. In a few months, Shadwell brought these valiant fops and epicures on the stage. The town was made merry with the character of a courageous but prodigal and effeminate coxcomb, who was impatient to cross swords with the best men in the French household troops, but who is much dejected by learning that he may find it difficult to have his champagne iced daily during the summer. He carries with him cooks, confectioners, and laundresses, a wagon load of plate, a wardrobe of laced and embroidered suits, and much rich tent furniture, of which the patterns have been chosen by a committee of ladies. End of section 6.
Section 7 of Chapter 17 of A History of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay Chapter 17, Section 7 while the hostile armies watched each other in Flanders, hostilities were carried out with somewhat more vigour in other parts of Europe. The French gained some advantages in Catalonia and in Piedmont. Their Turkish allies, who in the east menaced the dominions of the Emperor, were defeated by Louis of Baden in a great battle. But nowhere were the events of the summer so important as in Ireland. From October 1690 till May 1691, no military operation on a large scale was attempted in that kingdom. The area of the island was, during the winter and spring, not unequally divided between the contending races. The whole of Ulster, the greater part of Leinster, and about one-third of Munster, had submitted to the English. The whole of Connaught, the greater part of Munster, and two or three counties of Leinster were held by the Irish. The tortuous boundary formed by William's garrisons ran in a northeastern direction from the Bay of Castlehaven to Mallow, and then, inclining still further eastward, proceeded to Cashel. From Cashel the line went to Mullingar, from Mullingar to Longford, and from Longford to Cavan, skirted Loch Erne on the west, and met the ocean again at Ballyshannon. On the English side of this pale there was a rude and imperfect order. Two Lords Justices, Coningsby and Porter, assisted by a Privy Council, represented King William at Dublin Castle. Judges, sheriffs and justices of the peace had been appointed, and assizes were, after a long interval, held in several county towns. The colonists had meanwhile been formed into a strong militia under the command of officers who had commissions from the Crown. The train bands of the capital consisted of 2,500 foot, two troops of horse and two troops of dragoons, all Protestants and all well armed and clad. On the 4th of November, the anniversary of William's birth, and on the 5th, the anniversary of his landing at Torbay, the whole of this force appeared in all the pomp of war. The vanquished and disarmed natives assisted with suppressed grief and anger at the triumph of the castle which they had five months before oppressed and plundered with impunity. The Lord's Justices went in state to St. Patrick's Cathedral. Bells were rung, bonfires were lighted, hogsheads of ale and claret were set abroach in the streets, fireworks were exhibited on the college green, a great company of nobles and public functionaries feasted at the castle. And, as the second course came up, the trumpet sounded, and Ulster King-at-Arms proclaimed in Latin, French, and English, William and Mary, by the grace of God, King and Queen of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. Within the territory where the Saxon race was dominant, trade and industry had already begun to revive. The brazen counters which bore the image and superscription of James gave place to silver. The fugitives who had taken refuge in England came back in multitudes, and by their intelligence, diligence and thrift, the devastation caused by two years of confusion and robbery was soon in part repaired. Merchantmen heavily laden were constantly passing and repassing St. George's Channel. The receipts of the custom houses on the eastern coast from Cork to Londonderry amounted in six months to £67,500 a sum such as would have been thought extraordinary, even in the most prosperous times. The Irish, who remained within the English pale, were, one and all, hostile to the English domination. They were therefore subjected to a rigorous system of police, the natural though lamentable effect of extreme danger and extreme provocation. A papist was not permitted to have a sword or a gun. He was not permitted to go more than three miles out of his parish, except to the market town on the market day lest he should give information or assistance to his brethren who occupied the western half of the island, he was forbidden to live within ten miles of the frontier. Lest he should turn his house into a place of resort for malcontents, he was forbidden to sell liquor by retail. One proclamation announced that, if the property of any Protestant should be injured by marauders, his loss should be made good at the expense of his popish neighbours. 
Another gave notice that if any papist who had not been at least three months domiciled in Dublin should be found there, he should be treated as a spy. Not more than five papists were to assemble in the capital or its neighbourhood on any pretext. Without a protection from the government, no member of the Church of Rome was safe, and the government would not grant a protection to any member of the Church of Rome who had a son in the Irish army. In spite of all precautions and severities, however, the Celt found many opportunities of taking a sly revenge. Houses and barns were frequently burned, soldiers were frequently murdered, and it was scarcely possible to obtain evidence against the malefactors, who had with them the sympathies of the whole population. On such occasions the government sometimes ventured on acts which seemed better suited to a Turkish than to an English administration. One of these acts became a favourite theme of Jacobite pamphleteers and was the subject of a serious parliamentary inquiry at Westminster. Six musketeers were found butchered only a few miles from Dublin. The inhabitants of the village where the crime had been committed, men, women and children, were driven like sheep into the castle where the Privy Council was sitting. The heart of one of the assassins, named Gaffney, failed him. He consented to be a witness, was examined by the board, acknowledged his guilt and named some of his accomplices. He was then removed in custody, but a priest obtained access to him during a few minutes. What passed during those few minutes appeared when he was a second time brought before the council. He had the effrontery to deny that he had owned anything or accused anybody. His hearers, several of whom had taken down his confession in writing, were enraged at his impudence. The Lord's justices broke out. You are a rogue. You are a villain. You shall be hanged. Where is the provost marshal? The provost marshal came. Take that man, said Coningsby, pointing to Gaffney. Take that man and hang him. There was no gallows ready, but the carriage of a gun served the purpose, and the prisoner was instantly tied up without a trial, without even a written order for the execution, and this though the courts of law were sitting at the distance of only a few hundred yards. The English House of Commons, some years later, after a long discussion, resolved, without a division, that the order for the execution of Gaffney was arbitrary and illegal, but that Coningsby's fault was so much extenuated by the circumstance in which he was placed that it was not a proper subject for impeachment. It was not only by the implacable hostility of the Irish that the Saxon of the Pale was at this time harassed. His allies caused him almost as much annoyance as his helots. The help of troops from abroad was indeed necessary to him, but it was dearly bought. Even William, in whom the whole civil and military authority was concentrated, had found it difficult to maintain discipline in an army collected from many lands and composed in great part of mercenaries accustomed to live at free quarters. The powers which had been united in him were now divided and subdivided. The two Lords Justices considered the civil administration as their province, and left the army to the management of Ginkel, who was General-in-Chief. Ginkel kept excellent order among the auxiliaries from Holland, who were under his more immediate command, but his authority over the English and the Danes was less entire, and unfortunately their pay was, during part of the winter, in arrear. They indemnified themselves by excesses and exactions for the want of that which was their due, and it was hardly possible to punish men with severity for not choosing to starve with arms in their hands. At length, in the spring, large supplies of money and stores arrived, arrears were paid up, rations were plentiful, and a more rigid discipline was enforced. But too many traces of the bad habits which the soldiers had contracted were discernible till the close of the war. In that part of Ireland, meanwhile, which still acknowledged James as king, there could hardly be said to be any law, any property, or any government. The Roman Catholics of Ulster and Leinster had fled westwards by tens of thousands, driving before them a large part of the cattle which had escaped the havoc of two terrible years. The influx of food into the Celtic region, however, was far from keeping pace with the influx of consumers. The necessaries of life were scarce. Conveniences to which every plain farmer and burgess in England was accustomed could hardly be procured by nobles and generals. No coin was to be seen except lumps of base metal which were called crowns and shillings. Nominal prices were enormously high. A quart of ale cost two and sixpence, a quart of brandy three pounds. The only towns of any note on the western coast were Limerick and Galway, and the oppression which the shopkeepers of those towns underwent was such 
but many of them stole away with the remains of their stocks to the English territory, where a papist, though he had to endure much restraint and much humiliation, was allowed to put his own price on his goods and received that price in silver. Those traders who remained within the unhappy region were ruined. Every warehouse that contained any valuable property was broken open by ruffians who pretended that they were commissioned to procure stores for the public service, and the owner received in return for bales of cloth and hogsheads of sugar some fragments of old kettles and saucepans which would not in London or Paris have been taken by a beggar. As soon as a merchant ship arrived in the Bay of Galway or in the Shannon, she was boarded by these robbers. The cargo was carried away, and the proprietor was forced to content himself with such a quantity of cowhides, of wool and of tallow, as the gang which had plundered him chose to give him. The consequence was that while foreign commodities were pouring fast into the harbours of Londonderry, Carrickfergus, Dublin, Waterford and Cork, every mariner avoided Limerick and Galway as nests of pirates. The distinction between the Irish foot soldier and the Irish rapparee had never been very strongly marked. It now disappeared. Great part of the army was turned loose to live by marauding. An incessant predatory war raged along the line which separated the domain of William from that of James. Every day, companies of freebooters, sometimes wrapped in twisted straw, which served the purpose of armour, stole into the English territory, burned, sacked, pillaged, and hastened back to their own ground. To guard against these incursions was not easy, for the peasantry of the plundered country had a strong fellow feeling with the plunderers. To empty the granary, to set fire to the dwelling, to drive away the cows of a heretic, was regarded by every squalid inhabitant of a mud cabin as a good work. A troop engaged in such a work might confidently expect to fall in, notwithstanding all the proclamations of the Lord's justices, with some friend who would indicate the richest booty, the shortest road, and the safest hiding place. The English complained that it was no easy matter to catch a rapparee. Sometimes, when he saw danger approaching, he lay down in the long grass of the bog, and then it was as difficult to find him as to find a hare sitting. Sometimes he sprang into a stream and lay there like an otter, with only his mouth and nostrils above the water. Nay, a whole gang of banditti would, in the twinkling of an eye, transform itself into a crowd of harmless labourers. Every man took his gun to pieces, hid the lock in his clothes, stuck a cork in the muzzle, stopped the touch-hole with a quill, and threw the weapon into the next pond. Nothing was to be seen but a train of poor rustics, who had not so much as a cudgel among them, and whose humble look and crouching walk seemed to show that their spirit was thoroughly broken to slavery. When the peril was over, when the signal was given, every man flew to the place where he had hid his arms, and soon the robbers were in full march towards some Protestant mansion. One band penetrated to Clonmel, another to the vicinity of Maryborough, a third made its den in a woody islet of firm ground, surrounded by the vast bog of Allen, harried the county of Wicklow, and alarmed even the suburbs of Dublin. Such expeditions, indeed, were not always successful. Sometimes the plunderers fell in with parties of militia, or with detachments from the English garrisons, in situations in which disguise, flight, and resistance were alike impossible. When this happened, every kern who was taken was hanged, without any ceremony, on the nearest tree. At the headquarters of the Irish army there was, during the winter, no authority capable of exacting obedience even within the circle of a mile. Tyre Connell was absent at the court of France. He had left the supreme government in the hands of a council of regency composed of twelve persons. The nominal command of the army he had confided to Berwick. But Berwick, though, as was afterwards proved, a man of no common courage and capacity, was young and inexperienced. His powers were unsuspected by the world and by himself, and he submitted without reluctance to the tutelage of a council of war nominated by the Lord Lieutenant. Neither the council of regency nor the council of war was popular at Limerick. The Irish complained that men who were not Irish had been entrusted with a large share in the administration. The cry was loudest against an officer named Thomas Maxwell, for it was certain that he was a Scotchman. It was doubtful whether he was a Roman Catholic, and he had not concealed the dislike which he felt for that Celtic Parliament which had repealed the Act of Settlement and passed the Act of Attainder. 
the discontent fomented by the arts of intriguers, among whom cunning and unprincipled Henry Luttrell seems to have been the most active, soon broke forth into open rebellion. A great meeting was held. Many officers of the army, some peers, some lawyers of high note, and some prelates of the Roman Catholic Church were present. It was resolved that the government set up by the Lord Lieutenant was unknown to the Constitution. Ireland, it was said, could be legally governed in the absence of the King only by a Lord Lieutenant, by a Lord Deputy, or by Lords Justices. The King was absent, the Lord Lieutenant was absent, there was no Lord Deputy, and there were no Lords Justices. The act by which Ty O'Connell had delegated his authority to a junto composed of his creatures was a mere nullity. The nation was therefore left without any legitimate chief, and might, without violating the allegiance due to the crown, make temporary provision for its own safety. A deputation was sent to inform Berwick that he had assumed a power to which he had no right, but that nevertheless the army and people of Ireland would willingly acknowledge him as their head if he would consent to govern by the advice of a council truly Irish. Berwick indignantly expressed his wonder that military men should presume to meet and deliberate without the permission of their general. They answered that there was no general, and that, if his grace did not choose to undertake the administration on the terms proposed, another leader would easily be found. Berwick very reluctantly yielded, and continued to be a puppet in a new set of hands. Those who had effected this revolution thought it prudent to send a deputation to France for the purpose of vindicating their proceedings. Of the deputation, the Roman Catholic Bishop of York and the two Luttrells were members. In the ship which conveyed them from Limerick to Brest, they found a fellow passenger whose presence was by no means agreeable to them, their enemy, Maxwell. They suspected, and not without reason, that he was going, like them, to Saint-Germain, but on a very different errand. The truth was that Berwick had sent Maxwell to watch their motions and to traverse their designs. Henry Luttrell, the least scrupulous of men, proposed to settle the matter at once by tossing the Scotchman into the sea. But the bishop, who was a man of conscience, and Simon Luttrell, who was a man of honour, objected to this expedient. Meanwhile, at Limerick, the supreme power was in abeyance. Berwick, finding that he had no real authority, altogether neglected business, and gave himself up to such pleasures as that dreary place of banishment afforded. There was among the Irish chiefs no man of sufficient weight and ability to control the rest. Sarsfield, for a time, took the lead. But Sarsfield, though eminently brave and active in the field, was little skilled in the administration of war, and still less skilled in civil business. Those who were most desirous to support his authority were forced to own that his nature was too unsuspicious and indulgent for a post in which it was hardly possible to be too distrustful or too severe. He believed whatever was told him, he signed whatever was set before him. The commissaries, encouraged by his lenity, robbed and embezzled more shamelessly than ever. They sallied forth daily, guarded by pikes and firelocks, to seize, nominally for the public service, but really for themselves, wool, linen, leather, tallow, domestic utensils, instruments of husbandry, searched every pantry, every wardrobe, every cellar, and even laid sacrilegious hands on the property of priests and prelates. End of section 7 Section 8 of Chapter 17 of A History of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay Chapter 17, Section 8 Early in the spring, the government, if it is to be so called, of which Berwick was the ostensible head, was dissolved by the return of Tyoconnell. The Luttrells had, in the name of their countrymen, implored James not to subject so loyal a people to so odious and incapable a viceroy. Tyoconnell, they said, was old, he was infirm, he needed much sleep, he knew nothing of war, he was dilatory, he was partial, he was rapacious, he was distrusted and hated by the whole nation. The Irish, deserted by him, had made a gallant stand and had compelled the victorious army of the Prince of Orange to retreat. They hoped soon to take the field again 
thirty thousand strong, and they adjured their king to send them some captain worthy to command such a force. Tyrconnell and Maxwell, on the other hand, represented the delegates as mutineers, demagogues, traitors, and pressed James to send Henry Luttrell to keep Mountjoy Company in the Bastille. James, bewildered by these criminations and recriminations, hesitated long, and at last, with characteristic wisdom, relieved himself from trouble by giving all the quarrellers fair words and by sending them all back to have their fight out in Ireland. Berwick was at the same time recalled to France. Tyrconnell was received at Limerick, even by his enemies, with decent respect. Much as they hated him, they could not question the validity of his commission, and though they still maintained that they had been perfectly justified in annulling during his absence the unconstitutional arrangements which he had made, they acknowledged that, when he was present, he was their lawful governor. He was not altogether unprovided with the means of conciliating them, he brought many gracious messages and promises, a patent of peerage for Sarsfield, some money which was not of brass, and some clothing which was even more acceptable than money. The new garments were not indeed very fine, but even the generals had long been out at elbows, and there were few of the common men whose habiliments would have been thought sufficient to dress a scarecrow in a more prosperous country. Now at length, for the first time in many months, every private soldier could boast a pair of breeches and a pair of brogues. The Lord Lieutenant had also been authorised to announce that he should soon be followed by several ships, laden with provisions and military stores. This announcement was most welcome to the troops, who had long been without bread and who had nothing stronger than water to drink. During some weeks the supplies were impatiently expected, at last, Tyrconnell was forced to shut himself up, for, whenever he appeared in public, the soldiers ran after him, clamouring for food. Even the beef and mutton, which, half raw, half burnt, without vegetables, without salt, had hitherto supported the army, had become scarce, and the common men were on rations of horse-flesh when the promised sails were seen in the mouth of the Shannon. A distinguished French general named saint Ruth was on board with his staff, he bought a commission which appointed him commander-in-chief of the Irish army. The commission did not expressly declare that he was to be independent of the vice-regal authority, but he had been assured by James that Ty O'Connell should have secret instructions not to intermeddle in the conduct of the war. saint Ruth was assisted by another general officer named Dusson. The French ships bought some arms, some ammunition, and a plentiful supply of corn and flour. The spirits of the Irish rose, and the Te Deum was chaunted with fervent devotion in the Cathedral of Limerick. Tyrconnell had made no preparations for the approaching campaign, but saint Ruth, as soon as he had landed, exerted himself strenuously to redeem the time which had been lost. He was a man of courage, activity, and resolution, but of a harsh and imperious nature. In his own country he was celebrated as the most merciless persecutor that had ever dragooned the Huguenots to mass. It was asserted by English Whigs that he was known in France by the nickname of the hangman, and that, at Rome, the very cardinals had shown their abhorrence of his cruelty, and that even Queen Christina, who had little right to be squeamish about bloodshed, had turned away from him with loathing. He had recently held a command in Savoy. The Irish regiments in the French service had formed part of his army and had behaved extremely well. It was therefore supposed that he had a peculiar talent for managing Irish troops. But there was a wide difference between the well-clad, well-armed and well-drilled Irish with whom he was familiar and the ragged marauders whom he found swarming in the alleys of Limerick. Accustomed to the splendour and the discipline of French camps and garrisons, he was disgusted by finding that, in the country to which he had been sent, a regiment of infantry meant a mob of people as naked, as dirty, and as disorderly as the beggars whom he had been accustomed to see on the continent, besieging the door of a monastery, or pursuing a diligence up him. With ill-concealed contempt, however, he addressed himself vigorously to the task of disciplining these strange soldiers, and was day and night in the saddle, galloping from post to post, from Limerick to Athlone, from Athlone to the northern extremity of Loch Ray, and from Loch Ray back to Limerick. It was indeed necessary that he should bestir himself, for a few days after his arrival he learned that, on the other side of the pale, all was ready for action. The greater part of the English force was collected, before the close of May, in the neighbourhood of Mullingar. 
Ginkel commanded in chief. He had under him the two best officers after Marlborough, of whom our island could then boast, Talmash and Mackay. The Marquis of Ruvigny, the hereditary chief of the refugees and elder brother of the brave Kayamot, who had fallen at the Boyne, had joined the army with the rank of Major General. The Lord Justice Coningsby, though not by profession a soldier, came down from Dublin to animate the zeal of the troops. The appearance of the camp showed that the money voted by the English Parliament had not been spared. The uniforms were new, the ranks were one blaze of scarlet, and the train of artillery was such as had never before been seen in Ireland. On the 6th of June, Ginkell moved his headquarters from Mullingar. On the 7th, he reached Ballymore. At Ballymore, on a peninsula almost surrounded by something between a swamp and a lake, stood an ancient fortress which had recently been fortified under Sarsfield's direction, and which was defended by above a thousand men. The English guns were instantly planted. In a few hours the besiegers had the satisfaction of seeing the besieged running like rabbits from one shelter to another. The governor, who had at first held high language, begged piteously for quarter and obtained it. The whole garrison were marched off to Dublin. Only eight of the conquerors had fallen. Ginkell passed some days in reconstructing the defences of Ballymore. This work had scarcely been performed when he was joined by the Danish auxiliaries under the command of the Duke of Württemberg. The whole army then moved westwards and on the 19th of June appeared before the walls of Athlone. Athlone was perhaps, in a military point of view, the most important place in the island. Rosen, who understood war well, had always maintained that it was there that the Irishry would, with most advantage, make a stand against the Englishry. The town, which was surrounded by ramparts of earth, lay partly in Leinster and partly in Connaught. The English quarter, which was in Leinster, had once consisted of new and handsome houses, but had been burned by the Irish some months before, and now lay in heaps of ruin. The Celtic quarter, which was in Connaught, was old and meanly built. The Shannon, which is the boundary of the two provinces, rushed through Athlone in a deep and rapid stream and turned two large mills which rose on the arches of a stone bridge. Above the bridge on the Connaught side, a castle, built it was said by King John, towered to the height of seventy feet and extended two hundred feet along the river. Fifty or sixty yards below the bridge was a narrow ford. During the night of the 19th, the English placed their cannon. On the morning of the 20th, the firing began. At five in the afternoon, an assault was made. A brave French refugee with a grenade in his hand was the first to climb the breach and fell, cheering his countrymen to the onset with his latest breath. Such were the gallant spirits which the bigotry of Lewis had sent to recruit, in the time of his utmost need, the armies of his deadliest enemies. The example was not lost, the grenades fell thick, the assailants mounted by hundreds, the Irish gave way and ran towards the bridge. There the press was so great that some of the fugitives were crushed to death in the narrow passage, and others were forced over the parapets into the waters which roared among the mill wheels below. In a few hours Ginkel had made himself master of the English quarter of Athlone, and this success had cost him only twenty men killed and forty wounded. But his work was only begun. Between him and the Irish town, the Shannon ran fiercely. The bridge was so narrow that a few resolute men might keep it against an army. The mills which stood on it were strongly guarded, and it was commanded by the guns of the castle. That part of the Connaught shore where the river was fordable was defended by works, which the Lord Lieutenant had, in spite of the murmurs of a powerful party, forced Sir Ruth to entrust to the care of Maxwell. Maxwell had come back from France, a more unpopular man than he had been when he went thither. It was rumoured that he had, at Versailles, spoken opprobriously of the Irish nation, and he had on this account been, only a few days before, publicly affronted by Sarsfield. On the 21st of June, the English were busied in flinging up batteries along the Leinster bank. On the 22nd, soon after dawn, the cannonade began. The firing continued all that day and all the following night. When morning broke again, one whole side of the castle had been beaten down. The thatched lanes of the Celtic town lay in ashes, and one of the mills had been burned with sixty soldiers who defended it. Still, however, the Irish defended the bridge resolutely. During several days there was sharp fighting hand to hand in the straight passage. The assailants gained ground, but gained it inch by inch. 
the courage of the garrison was sustained by the hope of speedy succour. Sir Ruth had at length completed his preparations, and the tidings that Athlone was in danger had induced him to take the field in haste at the head of an army superior in number, though inferior in more important elements of military strength, to the army of Ginkell. The French general seems to have thought that the bridge and the ford might easily be defended till the autumnal rains, and the pestilence which ordinarily accompanied them should compel the enemy to retire. He therefore contented himself with sending successive detachments to reinforce the garrison. The immediate conduct of the defence he entrusted to his second-in-command, Dusson, and fixed his own headquarters two or three miles from the town. He expressed his astonishment that so experienced a commander as Ginkel should persist in a hopeless enterprise. His master ought to hang him for trying to take Athlone, and mine ought to hang me if I lose it. Sir Ruth, however, was by no means at ease. He had found to his great mortification that he had not the full authority which the promises made to him at Saint-Germain had entitled him to expect. The Lord Lieutenant was in the camp. His bodily and mental infirmities had perceptibly increased within the last few weeks. The slow and uncertain step with which he, who had once been renowned for vigour and agility, now tottered from his easy chair to his couch, was no unapt type of the sluggish and wavering movement of that mind which had once pursued its objects with a vehemence restrained neither by fear nor by pity, neither by conscience nor by shame. Yet, with impaired strength, both physical and intellectual, the broken old man clung pertinaciously to power. If he had received private orders not to meddle with the conduct of the war, he disregarded them. He assumed all the authority of a sovereign, showed himself ostentatiously to the troops as their supreme chief, and affected to treat St. Ruth as a lieutenant. Soon the interference of the Viceroy excited the vehement indignation of that powerful party in the army which had long hated him. Many officers signed an instrument by which they declared that they did not consider him as entitled to their obedience in the field. Some of them offered him gross personal insults. He was told to his face that, if he persisted in remaining where he was not wanted, the ropes of his pavilion should be cut. He, on the other hand, sent his emissaries to all the campfires and tried to make a party among the common soldiers against the French general. The only thing in which Tyrconnell and Sir Ruth agreed was in dreading and disliking Sarsfield. Not only was he popular with the great body of his countrymen, he was also surrounded by a knot of retainers whose devotion to him resembled the devotion of the Ismailite murderers to the old man of the mountain. It was known that one of these fanatics, a colonel, had used language which, in the mouth of an officer so high in rank, might well cause uneasiness. The king, this man had said, is nothing to me. I obey Sarsfield. Let Sarsfield tell me to kill any man in the whole army, and I will do it. Sarsfield was indeed too honourable a gentleman to abuse his immense power over the minds of his worshippers. But the Viceroy and the Commander-in-Chief might not unnaturally be disturbed by the thought that Sarsfield's honour was their only guarantee against mutiny and assassination. The consequence was that, at the crisis of the fate of Ireland, the services of the first of Irish soldiers was not used, or were used with jealous caution, and that, if he ventured to offer a suggestion, it was received with a sneer or a frown. A great and unexpected disaster put an end to these disputes. On the 30th of June, Ginkel called a council of war. Forage began to be scarce, and it was absolutely necessary that the besiegers should either force their way across the river or retreat. The difficulty of effecting a passage over the shattered remains of the bridge seemed almost insuperable. It was proposed to try the ford. The Duke of Württemberg, Talmash and Ruvigny gave their voices in favour of this plan, and Ginkel, with some misgivings, consented. It was determined that the attempt should be made that very afternoon. The Irish, fancying that the English were about to retreat, kept guard carelessly. Part of the garrison was idling, part dosing. Dusson was at table, Saint-Ruth was in his tent, writing a letter to his master filled with charges against Tyrconnell. Meanwhile, 1,500 grenadiers, each wearing in his hat a green bough, were mustered on the Leinster bank of the Shannon. Many of them doubtless remembered that on that day year they had, at the command of King William, put green boughs in their hats on the banks of the Boyne. Guineas had been liberally scattered among these picked men, but their alacrity was such as gold cannot purchase. 
Six battalions were in readiness to support the attack. Mackay commanded. He did not approve of the plan, but he executed it as zealously and energetically as if he had himself been the author of it. The Duke of Württemberg, Talmash, and several other gallant officers, to whom no part in the enterprise had been assigned, insisted on serving that day as private volunteers, and their appearance in the ranks excited the fiercest enthusiasm among the soldiers. It was six o'clock. A peal from the steeple of the church gave the signal. Prince George of Hesse-Darmstadt and Gustavus Hamilton, the brave chief of the Enniskillers, descended first into the Shannon. And then the grenadiers lifted the Duke of Württemberg on their shoulders, and with a great shout plunged twenty abreast up to their cravats in water. The stream ran deep and strong, but in a few minutes the head of the column reached dry land. Talmash was the fifth man that set foot on the Connaught shore. The Irish, taken unprepared, fired one confused volley and fled, leaving their commander Maxwell a prisoner. The conquerors clambered up the bank over the remains of walls shattered by a cannonade of ten days. Mackay heard his men cursing and swearing as they stumbled among the rubbish. "'My lads!' cried the stout old Puritan in the midst of the uproar. "'You are brave fellows, but do not swear. We have more reason to thank God for the goodness which he has shown us this day than to take his name in vain.' The victory was complete. Planks were placed on the broken arches of the bridge and pontoons laid on the river without any opposition on the part of the terrified garrison. With the loss of twelve men killed and about thirty wounded, the English had, in a few minutes, forced their way into Connaught. At the first alarm, Dusson hastened towards the river, but he was met, swept away, trampled down, and almost killed by the torrent of fugitives. He was carried to the camp in such a state that it was necessary to bleed him. "'Taken!' cried Sam Ruth in dismay. "'It cannot be. A town taken, and I close by with an army to relieve it.' Cruelly mortified, he struck his tents under cover of the night and retreated in the direction of Galway. At dawn, the English saw far off from the top of King John's ruined castle the Irish army moving through the dreary region which separates the Shannon from the Suck. Before noon, the rearguard had disappeared. End of section 8「History of England」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay Chapter 17 Even before the loss of Athlin, the Celtic camp had been distracted by factions. It may easily be supposed, therefore, that, after so great a disaster, nothing was to be heard but crimination and recrimination. The enemies of the Lord Lieutenant were more clamorous than ever. He and his creatures had brought the kingdom to the verge of perdition. He would meddle with what he did not understand. He would overrule the plans of men who were real soldiers. He would entrust the most important of all posts to his tool, his spy, the wretched Maxwell not a born irishman not a sincere catholic at best a blunderer and too probably a traitor maxwell it was affirmed had left his men unprovided with ammunition when they had applied to him for powder and ball he had asked whether they wanted to shoot larks just before the attack he had told them to go to their supper and to take their rest for that nothing more would be done that day when he had delivered himself up a prisoner he had uttered some words which seemed to indicate a previous understanding with the conquerors the Lord Lieutenant's few friends told a very different story. According to them, Draconnell and Maxwell had suggested precautions which would have made a surprise impossible. The French general, impatient of all interference, had omitted to take those precautions. Maxwell had been rudely told that, if he was afraid, he had better resign his command. He had done his duty bravely. He had stood while his men fled. He had consequently fallen into the hands of the enemy, and he was now, in his absence, slandered by those to whom his captivity was justly imputable. On which side the truth lay, it is not easy, at this distance of time, to pronounce. The cry against Tyrconnell was, at the moment, so loud, that he gave way and sullenly retired to Limerick. Disson, who had not yet recovered from the hurts inflicted by his own runaway troops, repaired to Galway. St. Ruth, now left in undisputed possession of the supreme command, was bent on trying the chances of a battle. Most of the Irish officers, with Sarsfield at their head, were of a very different mind. It was, they said, not to be dissembled that, in discipline, the army of Ginkle was far superior to theirs. 
The wise course, therefore, evidently was to carry on the war in such a manner that the difference between the disciplined and the undisciplined soldiers might be as small as possible. It was well known that raw recruits often played their part well in a foray, in a street fight or in the defense of a rampart, but that, on a pitched field, they had little chance against veterans. Let most of our foot be collected behind the walls of Limerick and Galway. Let the rest, together with our horse, get in the rear of the enemy and cut off his supplies. If he advances in Connaught, let us overrun Leinster. If he sits down before Galway, which may well be defended, let us make a push for Dublin, which is altogether defenceless. St. Ruth might, perhaps, have thought this advice good if his judgment had not been biased by his passions. But he was smarting from the pain of a humiliating defeat. In sight of his tent, the English had passed a rapid river and had stormed a strong town. He could not but feel that, though others might have been to blame, he was not himself blameless. He had, to say the least, taken things too easily. Lewis, accustomed to be served during many years by commanders who were not in the habit of leaving to chance anything which could be made secure by wisdom, would hardly think it a sufficient excuse that his general had not expected the enemy to make so bold and sudden an attack. The Lord Lieutenant would, of course, represent what had passed in the most unfavorable manner, and whatever the Lord Lieutenant said, James would echo. A sharp reprimand, a letter of recall, might be expected. To return to Versailles a culprit, to approach the great king in an agony of distress, to see him shrug his shoulders, knit his brow, and turn his back, to be sent, far from courts and camps, to languish at some dull country seat, this was too much to be borne, and yet this might well be apprehended. There was one escape, to fight and to conquer or to perish. In such a temper St. Ruth pitched his camp about thirty miles from Athlon on the road to Galway, near the ruined castle of Angram, and determined to await the approach of the English army. His whole department was changed. He had hitherto treated the Irish soldiers with contemptuous severity. But now that he had resolved to stake life and fame on the valor of the despised race, he became another man. During the few days which remained to him, he exerted himself to win by indulgence and caresses the hearts of all who were under his command. He, at the same time, administered to his troops moral stimulants of the most potent kind. He was a zealous Roman Catholic, and it is probable that the severity with which he had treated the Protestants of his own country ought to be partly ascribed to the hatred which he felt for their doctrines. He now tried to give to the war the character of a crusade. The clergy were the agents whom he employed to sustain the courage of his soldiers. The whole camp was in a ferment with religious excitement. In every regiment priests were praying, preaching, shriving, holding up the host in the cup. While the soldiers swore on the sacramental bread not to abandon their colors, the general addressed to the officers an appeal which might have moved the most languid and effeminate natures to heroic exertion. They were fighting, he said, for their religion, their liberty, and their honor. Unhappy events, too widely celebrated, had brought a reproach on the national character. Irish soldiership was everywhere mentioned with a sneer. If they wished to retrieve the fame of their country, this was the time and this the place. The spot on which he had determined to bring the fate of Ireland to issue seems to have been chosen with great judgment. His army was drawn up on the slope of a hill, which was almost surrounded by red bog. In front, near the edge of the morris, were some fences out of which a breastwork was without difficulty constructed. On the 11th of July, Ginkle, having repaired the fortifications of Athlin and left a garrison there, fixed his headquarters at Ballinasloe, about four miles from Agram, and rode forward to take a view of the Irish position. On his return he gave orders that ammunition should be served out, that every musket and bayonet should be got ready for action, and that early on the morrow every man should be under arms without beat of drum. Two regiments were to remain in charge of the camp. The rest, unencumbered by baggage, were to march against the enemy. Soon after six the next morning, the English were on the way to Agram. But some delay was occasioned by a thick fog which hung till noon over the moist valley of the Suck. A further delay was caused by the necessity of dislodging the Irish from some outposts, and the afternoon was far advanced when the two armies at length confronted each other, with nothing but the bog and the breastwork between them. The English and their allies were under twenty thousand, the Irish above twenty-five thousand. Ginkel held a short consultation with his principal officers. Should he attack instantly, or wait till the next morning? Mackay was for attacking instantly, and his opinion prevailed. At five the battle began. The English foot, in such order as they could keep on treacherous and uneven ground, made their way, sinking deep in mud at every step, to the Irish works. But those works were defended with a resolution such as extorted some words of ungracious eulogy even from men who entertained the strongest prejudices against the Celtic race. 
Again and again the assailants were driven back. Again and again they returned to the struggle. Once they were broken and chased across the morris, but, but Talmash rallied them and forced the pursuers to retire. The fight had lasted two hours, the evening was closing in, and still the advantage was on the side of the Irish. Ginkle began to meditate a retreat. The hopes of St. Ruth rose high. "'The day is ours, my boys,' he cried, waving his hat in the air. "'We will drive them before us to the walls of Dublin.' But fortune was already on the turn. Mackay and Ravigny, with the English and Huguenot cavalry, had succeeded in passing the bog at a place where two horsemen could scarcely ride abreast. St. Ruth at first laughed when he saw the blues in single file struggling through the morris under a fire which every moment laid some gallant hat and feather on the earth. "'What do they mean?' he asked, and then he swore that it was pity to see such fine fellows rushing to certain destruction. "'Let them cross, however,' he said. "'The more they are, the more we shall kill.' But soon he saw them laying hurdles on the quagmire. A broader and safer path was formed. Squadron after squadron reached firm ground. The flank of the Irish army was speedily turned. The French general was hastening to the rescue when a cannonball carried off his head. Those who were about him thought that it would be dangerous to make his fate known. His corpse was wrapped in a cloak, carried from the field, and laid, with all secrecy, in the sacred ground among the ruins of the ancient monastery of Louvry. Till the fight was over, neither army was aware that he was no more. To conceal his death from the private soldiers might perhaps have been prudent. To conceal it from his lieutenants was madness. The crisis of the battle had arrived, and there was none to give direction. Sarsfield was in command of the reserve, but he had been strictly enjoined by St. Ruth not to stir without orders, and no orders came. Mackay and Ravigny, with their horse, charged the Irish in flank. Talmash and his foot returned to the attack in front with dogged determination. The breastwork was carried. The Irish, still fighting, retreated from enclosure to enclosure, but, as enclosure after enclosure was forced, their efforts became fainter and fainter. At length they broke and fled, then followed a horrible carnage. The conquerors were in a savage mood, for a report had been spread among them that, during the early part of the battle, some English captives who had been admitted to quarter had been put to the sword. Only four hundred prisoners were taken. The number of the slain was, in proportion to the number engaged, greater than in any other battle of that age. But for the coming on of a moonless night made darker by a mystery rain, scarcely a man would have escaped. The obscurity enabled Sarsfield, with a few squadrons which still remained unbroken, to cover the retreat. Of the conquerors, six hundred were killed, and about a thousand wounded. The English slept that night on the field of battle. On the following day they buried their companions in arms, and then marched westward. The vanquished were left unburied, a strange and ghastly spectacle. Four thousand Irish corpses were counted on the field of battle. A hundred and fifty lay in one small enclosure, a hundred and twenty in another. But the slaughter had not been confined to the field of battle. One who is there tells us that, from the top of the hill on which the Celtic camp had been pitched, he saw the country, to the distance of near four miles, white with the naked bodies of the slain. The plain looked, he said, like an immense pasture covered by flocks of sheep. As usual, different estimates were formed even by eyewitnesses, but it seems probable that the number of the Irish who fell was not less than seven thousand. Soon a multitude of dogs came to feast on the carnage. These beasts became so fierce and acquired such a taste for human flesh that it was long dangerous for men to travel this road otherwise than in companies. The beaten army had now lost all the appearance of an army and resembled a rabble crowding home from a fair after a faction fight. One great stream of fugitives ran towards Galway, another towards Limerick. The roads to both cities were covered with weapons which had been flung away. Ginkill offered sixpence for every musket. In a short time so many wagon-loads were collected that he reduced the price to twopence, and still great numbers of muskets came in. The conquerors marched fire against Galway. Disson was there, and had under him seven regiments, thinned by the slaughter of Agram, and utterly disorganized and disheartened. The last hope of the garrison and of the Roman Catholic inhabitants was that Baldir Godonel, the promised deliverer of their race, would come to the rescue. But Baldir Godonel was not duped by the superstitious veneration of which he was the object. While there remained any doubt about the issue of the conflict between the Englishry and the Irishry, he had stood aloof. On the day of the battle he had remained at a safe distance with his tumultuary army, and as soon as he had learned that his countrymen had been put to rout, he fled, plundering and burning all the way, to the mountains of Mayo. Thence he sent to Ginkle offers of submission and service. Ginkle gladly seized the opportunity of breaking up a formidable band of marauders, and of turning to good account the influence which the name of the Celtic dynasty still exercised over the Celtic race. The negotiation, however, was not without difficulties. 
the wandering adventurer at first demanded nothing less than an earldom after some haggling he consented to sell the love of a whole people and his pretensions to regal dignity for a pension of five hundred pounds a year yet the spell which bound his followers to hire was not altogether broken some enthusiasts from ulster were willing to fight under the o'donnell against their own language and their own religion with a small body of these devoted adherents he joined a division of the english army and on several occasions did useful service to william when it was known that no succor was to be expected from the hero whose advent had been foretold by so many seers the irish who were shut up in galway lost all heart Disson had returned a stout answer to the first summons of the besiegers but he soon saw that resistance was impossible and made haste to capitulate the garrison was suffered to retire to limerick with the honours of war a full amnesty for past offences was granted to the citizens and it was stipulated that within the walls the roman catholic priests should be allowed to perform in private the rites of their religion on these terms the gates were thrown open ginkle was received with profound respect by the mayor and aldermen and was complimented in a set speech by the recorder de Son, with about two thousand three hundred men marched unmolested to limerick at limerick the last asylum of the vanquished race the authority of tyrconnel was supreme there was now no general who could pretend that his commission made him independent of the lord lieutenant nor was the lord lieutenant now so unpopular as he had been a fortnight earlier since the battle there had been a reflux of public feeling no part of that great disaster could be imputed to the viceroy his opinion indeed had been against trying the chances of a pitched field and he could with some plausibility assert that the neglect of his counsels had caused the ruin of ireland he made some preparations for defending limerick repaired the fortifications and sent out parties to bring in provisions the country many miles round was swept bare by these detachments and a considerable quantity of cattle and fodder was collected within the walls there was also a large stock of biscuit imported from france the infantry assembled at limerick were about fifteen thousand men the irish horse and dragoons three or four thousand in number were encamped on the clare side of the shannon the communication between their camp and the city was maintained by means of a bridge called the thomond bridge which was protected by a fort these means of defence were not contemptible but the fall of athlon and the slaughter of agram had broken the spirit of the army a small party at the head of which were sarsfield and a brave scotch officer named watchup cherished a hope that the triumphant progress of ginkle might be stopped by those walls from which william had in the preceding year been forced to retreat but many of the irish chiefs loudly declared that it was time to think of capitulating henry luttrell always fond of dark and crooked politics opened a secret negotiation with the english one of his letters was intercepted and he was put under arrest but many who blamed his perfidy agreed with him in thinking that it was idle to prolong the contest tyrconnel himself was convinced that all was lost his only hope was that he might be able to prolong the struggle till he could receive from st germain's permission to treat he wrote to request that permission and prevailed with some difficulty on his desponding countrymen to bind themselves by an oath not to capitulate till an answer from james should arrive a few days after the oath had been administered tyrconnel was no more on the eleventh of august he dined with Dusson. the party was gay the lord lieutenant seemed to have thrown off the load which had bowed down his body and mind he drank he jested he was again the dick talbot who had diced and revelled with gramont soon after he had risen from table an apoplectic stroke deprived him of speech and sensation on the fourteenth he breathed his last the wasted remains of that form which had once been a model for statuaries were laid under the pavement of the cathedral but no inscription no tradition preserves the memory of the spot as soon as the lord lieutenant was no more plowden who had superintended the irish finances while there were any irish finances to superintend produced a commission under the great seal of james this commission appointed plowden himself fitton and nagel lord justices in the event of tyrconnel's death there was much murmuring when the names were made known for both plowden and fitton were saxons the commission however proved to be a mere nullity for it was accompanied by instructions which forbade the lord's justices to interfere in the conduct of the war and within the narrow space to which the dominions of james were now reduced war was the only business the government was therefore really in the hands of Dusson and sarsfield end of section nine recording by Jen Raimundo. section ten of chapter seventeen of a history of england this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 10. 
On the day on which Ducarnel died, the advance guard of the English army came within sight of Limerick. Ginkle encamped on the same ground which William had occupied twelve months before. The batteries, on which were planted guns and bombs, very different from those which William had been forced to use, played day and night, and soon roofs were blazing and walls crashing in every corner of the city. Whole streets were reduced to ashes. Meanwhile, several English ships of war came up the Shannon and anchored about a mile below the city. Still the place held out. The garrison was, in numerical strength, little inferior to the besieging army, and it seemed not impossible that the defense might be prolonged till the equinoctial rains should a second time compel the English to retire. Ginkle determined on striking a bold stroke. No point in the whole circle of the fortifications was more important, and no point seemed to be more secure than the Thomond Bridge, which joined the city to the camp of the Irish horse on the Clare Bank of the Shannon. The Dutch general's plan was to separate the infantry within the ramparts from the cavalry without, and this plan he executed with great skill, vigor, and success. He laid a bridge of tin boats on the river, crossed it with a strong body of troops, drove before him in confusion fifteen hundred dragoons who made a faint show of resistance, and marched towards the quarters of the Irish horse. The Irish horse sustained but ill on this day the reputation which they had gained at the Boyne. Indeed, that reputation had been purchased by the almost entire destruction of the best regiments. Recruits had been without much difficulty found, but the loss of fifteen hundred excellent soldiers was not to be repaired. The camp was abandoned without a blow. Some of the cavalry fled into the city. The rest, driving before them as many cattle as could be collected in that moment of panic, retired to the hills. Much beef, brandy, and harness was found in the magazines, and the marshy plain of the Shannon was covered with firelocks and grenades which the fugitives had thrown away. The conquerors returned in triumph to their camp, but Ginko was not content with the advantage which he had gained. He was bent on cutting off all communication between Limerick and the county of Clare. In a few days, therefore, he again crossed the river at the head of several regiments, and attacked the fort which protected the Thalmond Bridge. In a short time the fort was stormed. The soldiers who had garrisoned it fled in confusion to the city. The town major, a French officer, who commanded at the Tom and Gate, afraid that the pursuers would enter with the fugitives, ordered that part of the bridge which was nearest to the city to be drawn up. Many of the Irish went headlong into the stream and perished there. Others cried for quarter, and held up handkerchiefs in token of submission. But the conquerors were mad with rage, their cruelty could not be immediately restrained, and no prisoners were made till the heaps of corpses rose above the parapets. The garrison of the fort had consisted of about eight hundred men. Of these, only a hundred and twenty escaped into Limerick. This disaster seemed likely to produce a general mutiny in the besieged city. The Irish clamored for the blood of the town major who had ordered the bridge to be drawn up in the face of their flying countrymen. His superiors were forced to promise that he should be brought before a court-martial. Happily for him, he had received a mortal wound in the act of closing the Tom and Gate, and was saved by a soldier's death from the fury of the multitude. The cry for capitulation became so loud and importunate that the generals could not resist it. De Son informed his government that the fight at the bridge had so effectually cowed the spirit of the garrison that it was impossible to continue the struggle. Some exception may perhaps be taken to the evidence of de Son, for undoubtedly he, like every Frenchman who had held any command in the Irish army, was weary of his banishment and impatient to see Paris again. But it is certain that even Sarsfield had lost heart. Up to this time his voice had been for stubborn resistance. He was now not only willing, but impatient to treat. There was no hope of succor, domestic or foreign. In every part of Ireland the Saxons had set their feet on the necks of the natives. Sligo had fallen. Even those wild islands which intercept the huge waves of the Atlantic from the Bay of Galway had acknowledged the authority of William. The men of Kerry, reputed the fiercest and most ungovernable part of the aboriginal population, had held out long, but had at length been routed and chased to their woods and mountains. A French fleet, if a French fleet were now to arrive on the coast of Munster, would find the mouth of the Shannon guarded by English men of war. The stock of provisions within Limerick was already running low. If the siege were prolonged, the town would, in all human probability, be reduced either by force or by blockade. And if Ginkle should enter through the breach, or should be implored by a multitude perishing with hunger to dictate his own terms, what could be expected but a tyranny more inexorably severe than that of Cromwell? Would it not then be wise to try what conditions could be obtained while the victors had still something to fear from the rage and despair of the vanquished, while the last Irish army could still make some show of resistance behind the walls of the last Irish fortress? 
On the evening of the day which followed the fight at the Tommond Gate, the drums of Limerick beat a parley, and woke up from one of the towers, hailed the besiegers, and requested Rivigny to grant Sarsfield an interview. The brave Frenchman, who was an exile on account of his attachment to one religion, and the brave Irishman, who was about to become an exile on account of his attachment to another, met and conferred, doubtless with mutual sympathy and respect. Ginkle, to whom Rivigny reported what had passed, willingly consented to an armistice. For constant as his success had been, it had not made him secure. The chances were greatly on his side, yet it was possible that an attempt to storm the city might fail, as a similar attempt had failed twelve months before. If the siege should be turned into a blockade, it was probable that the pestilence which had been fatal to the army of Schomberg, which had compelled William to retreat, and which had all but prevailed even against the genius and energy of Marlborough, might soon avenge the carnage of Agram. The rains had lately been heavy. The whole plain might shortly be an immense pool of stagnant water. It might be necessary to move the troops to a healthier situation than the bank of the Shannon, and to provide for them a warmer shelter than that of tents. The enemy would be safe till the spring. In the spring a French army might land in Ireland, the natives might again rise in arms from Donegal to Kerry, and the war, which was now all but extinguished, might blaze forth fiercer than ever. A negotiation was therefore opened with a sincere desire on both sides to put an end to the contest. The chiefs of the Irish army held several consultations at which some Roman Catholic prelates and some eminent lawyers were invited to assist. A preliminary question, which perplexed tender consciences, was submitted by the bishops. The late Lord Lieutenant had persuaded the officers of the garrison to swear that they would not surrender Limerick till they should receive an answer to the letter in which their situation had been explained to James. The bishops thought that the oath was no longer binding. It had been taken at a time when the communications with France were open, and in the full belief that the answer of James would arrive within three weeks. More than twice that time had elapsed. Every avenue leading to the city was strictly guarded by the enemy. His Majesty's faithful subjects, by holding out till it had become impossible for him to signify his pleasure to them, had acted up to the spirit of their promise. The next question was what terms should be demanded. A paper, containing propositions which statesmen of our age will think reasonable, but which to the most humane and liberal English Protestants of the seventeenth century appeared extravagant, was sent to the camp of the besiegers. What was asked was that all offences should be covered with oblivion, that perfect freedom of worship should be allowed to the native population, that every parish should have its priest, and that Irish Roman Catholics should be capable of holding all offices, civil and military, and of enjoying all municipal privileges. Ginkle knew little of the laws and feelings of the English, but he had about him persons who were competent to direct him. They had a week before prevented him from breaking a rapery on the wheel, and they now suggested an answer to the propositions of the enemy. "'I am a stranger here,' said Ginkle. "'I am ignorant of the constitution of these kingdoms, but I am assured that what you ask is inconsistent with that constitution, and therefore I cannot honour with consent.' He immediately ordered a new battery to be thrown up, and guns and mortars to be planted on it, but his preparations were speedily interrupted by another message from the city— the Irish begged that, since he could not grant what they had demanded, he would tell them what he was willing to grant. He called his advisers round him, and after some consultation, sent back a paper containing the heads of a treaty, such as he had reason to believe that the government which he served would approve. What he offered was indeed much less than what the Irish desired, but was quite as much as, when they considered their situation and the temper of the English nation, they could expect. They speedily notified their assent. It was agreed that there should be a cessation of arms, not only by land, but in the ports and bays of Munster, and that a fleet of French transports should be suffered to come up the Shannon in peace and to depart in peace. The signing of the treaty was deferred till the Lord's Justices, who represented William at Dublin, should arrive at Ginkle's quarters. But there was during some days a relaxation of military vigilance on both sides. Prisoners were set at liberty. The outposts of the two armies chatted and messed together. The English officers rambled into the town. The Irish officers dined in the camp. Anecdotes of what passed at the friendly meetings of these men, who had so lately been mortal enemies, were widely circulated. One story, in particular, was repeated in every part of Europe. "'Has not this last campaign,' said Sarsfield to some English officers, "'raised your opinion of Irish soldiers?' "'To tell you the truth,' answered an Englishman, "'we think of them much as we always did.' "'However meanly you may think of us,' replied Sarsfield, "'change kings with us, and we will willingly try our luck with you again.' He was doubtless thinking of the day on which he had seen the two sovereigns at the head of two great armies, William foremost in the charge, and James foremost in the flight. 
On the 1st of October, Coningsby and Porter arrived at the English headquarters. On the 2nd, the articles of capitulation were discussed at great length and definitely settled. On the 3rd, they were signed. They were divided into two parts, a military treaty and a civil treaty. The former was subscribed only by the generals on both sides. The Lord's Justices set their names to the latter. By the military treaty it was agreed that such Irish officers and soldiers as should declare that they wished to go to France should be conveyed thither, and should, in the meantime, remain under the command of their own generals. Ginkle undertook to furnish a considerable number of transports. French vessels were also to be permitted to pass and repass freely between Brittany and Munster. Part of Limerick was to be immediately delivered up to the English, but the island on which the cathedral and the castle stand was to remain, for the present, in the keeping of the Irish. The terms of the civil treaty were very different from those which Ginkle had sternly refused to grant. It was not stipulated that the Roman Catholics of Ireland should be competent to hold any political or military office, or that they should be admitted into any corporation. But they obtained a promise that they should enjoy such privileges in the exercise of their religion as were consistent with the law, or as they had enjoyed in the reign of Charles the Second. To all inhabitants of Limerick, and to all officers and soldiers in the Jacobite army, who should submit to the government and notify their submission by taking the oath of allegiance, an entire amnesty was promised. They were to retain their property, they were to be allowed to exercise any profession which they had exercised before the troubles, they were not to be punished for any treason, felony, or misdemeanor committed since the accession of the late king, nay, they were not to be sued for damages on account of any act of spoliation or outrage which they might have committed during the three years of confusion. This was more than the Lord's justices were constitutionally competent to grant. It was therefore added that the government would use its utmost endeavors to obtain a parliamentary ratification of the treaty. As soon as the two instruments had been signed, the English entered the city and occupied one quarter of it. A narrow but deep branch of the Shannon separated them from the quarter which was still in possession of the Irish. In a few hours a dispute arose which seemed likely to produce a renewal of hostilities. Sarsfield had resolved to seek his fortune in the servants of France, and was naturally desirous to carry with him to the continent such a body of troops as would be an important addition to the army of Lewis. Ginkel was as naturally unwilling to send thousands of men to swell the forces of the enemy. Both generals appealed to the treaty. Each construed it as suited his purpose, and each complained that the other had violated it. Sarsfield was accused of putting one of his officers under arrest for refusing to go to the continent. Ginkel, greatly excited, declared that he would teach the Irish to play tricks with him, and began to make preparations for a cannonade. Sarsfield came to the English camp, and tried to justify what he had done. The altercation was sharp. "'I submit,' said Sarsfield at last. "'I am in your power.' "'Not at all in my power,' said Ginkel. "'Go back and do your worst.' The imprisoned officer was liberated, a sanguinary contest was averted, and the two commanders contented themselves with the war of words. Ginkel put forth proclamations assuring the Irish that, if they would live quietly in their own land, they should be protected and favoured, and that if they preferred a military life, they should be admitted into the service of King William. It was added that no man, who chose to reject this gracious invitation and to become a soldier of Lewis, must expect ever again to set foot on the island. Sarsfield and Wacup exerted their eloquence on the other side. The present aspect of affairs, they said, was doubtless gloomy, but there was bright sky beyond the cloud. The banishment would be short. The return would be triumphant. Within a year the French would invade England. In such an invasion the Irish troops, if only they remained unbroken, would assuredly bear a chief part. In the meantime it was far better for them to live in a neighboring and friendly country, under the parental care of their own rightful king, than to trust to the Prince of Orange, who would probably send them to the other end of the world to fight for his ally the Emperor against the Janissaries. The help of the Roman Catholic clergy was called in. On the day on which those who had made up their minds to go to France were required to announce their determination, the priests were indefatigable in exhorting. At the head of every regiment a sermon was preached on the duty of adhering to the cause of the church, and on the sin and danger of consorting with unbelievers. Whoever, it was said, should enter the service of the usurpers would do so at the peril of his soul. The heretics affirmed that, after the peroration, a plentiful allowance of brandy was served out to the audience, and that when the brandy had been swallowed, a bishop pronounced a benediction. Thus duly prepared by physical and moral stimulants, the garrison, consisting of about fourteen thousand infantry, was drawn up in the vast meadow which lay on the clare bank of the Shannon. Here copies of Ginkle's proclamation were profusely scattered about, and English officers went through the ranks imploring the men not to ruin themselves, and explaining to them the advantages which the soldiers of King William enjoyed. 
At length the decisive moment came. The troops were ordered to pass in review. Those who wished to remain in Ireland were directed to file off at a particular spot. All who passed that spot were to be considered as having made their choice for France. Sarsfield and Wacup on one side, Porter, Coningsby, and Ginkle on the other, looked on with painful anxiety. Dusson and his countrymen, though not uninterested in the spectacle, found it hard to preserve their gravity. The confusion, the clamour, the grotesque appearance of an army in which there could scarcely be seen a shirt or a pair of pantaloons, a shoe or a stocking, presented so ludicrous a contrast to the orderly and brilliant appearance of their master's troops, that they amused themselves by wondering what the Parisians would say to see such a force mustered on the plain of Grenelle. End of section 10. Recording by Jen Raimundo. Section 11 of Chapter 17 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 17, Section 11. First marched what was called the Royal Regiment, 1,400 strong. All but seven went beyond the fatal point. Ginkle's countenance showed that he was deeply mortified. He was consoled, however, by seeing the next regiment, which consisted of natives of Ulster, turn off to a man. There had arisen, notwithstanding the community of blood, language and religion, an antipathy between the Celts of Ulster and those of the other three provinces, nor is it improbable that the example and influence of Baldir Gordano may have had some effect on the people of the land which his forefathers had ruled. In most of the regiments there was a division of opinion, but a great majority declared for France. Henry Luttrell was one of those who turned off. He was rewarded for his desertion, and perhaps for other services, with a grant of the large estate of his elder brother Simon, who firmly adhered to the cause of James, with a pension of five hundred pounds a year from the crown, and with the abhorrence of the Roman Catholic population. After living in wealth, luxury, and infamy during a quarter of a century, Henry Luttrell was murdered while going through Dublin in his sedan chair and the Irish House of Commons declared that there was reason to suspect that he had fallen by the revenge of the Papists. Eighty years after his death, his grave near Luttrellstown was violated by the descendants of those whom he had betrayed, and his skull was broken to pieces with a pickaxe. The deadly hatred of which he was the object descended to his son and to his grandson, and unhappily nothing in the character either of his son or of his grandson tended to mitigate the feeling which the name of Luttrell excited. When the long procession had closed, it was found that about a thousand men had agreed to enter into William's service. About two thousand accepted passes from Ginkle and went quietly home. About eleven thousand returned with Sarsfield to the city. A few hours after the garrison had passed in review, the horse, who were encamped some miles from the town, were required to make their choice, and most of them volunteered for France. Sarsfield considered the troops who remained with him as under an irrevocable obligation to go abroad, and lest they should be tempted to retract their consent, he confined them within the ramparts, and ordered the gates to be shut and strongly guarded. Ginkle, though in his vexation he muttered some threats, seems to have felt that he could not justifiably interfere. But the precautions of the Irish general were far from being completely successful. It was by no means strange that a superstitious and excitable Carn, with a sermon and a dram in his head, should be ready to promise whatever his priest required. Neither was it strange that, when he had slept off his liquor, and when anathemas were no longer ringing in his ears, he should feel painful misgivings. He had bound himself to go into exile, perhaps for life, beyond that dreary expanse of waters which impressed his rude mind with mysterious terror. His thoughts ran on all that he was to leave, on the well-known peat stack and potato ground, and on the mud cabin which, humble as it was, was still his home. He was never again to see the familiar faces round the turf fire, or to hear the familiar notes of the old Celtic songs. The ocean was to roll between him and the dwelling of his grey-headed parents, and his blooming sweetheart. Here were some who, unable to bear the misery of such a separation, and finding it impossible to pass the sentinels who watched the gates, sprang into the river and gained the opposite bank. The number of these daring swimmers, however, was not great, and the army would probably have been transported almost entire if it had remained at Limerick till the day of embarkation. But many of the vessels in which the voyage was to be performed lay at Cork, and it was necessary that Sarsfield should proceed thither with some of his best regiments. It was a march of not less than four days through a wild country. To prevent agile youths, familiar with all the shifts of a vagrant and predatory life, from stealing off to the bogs and woods under cover of the night, was impossible. 
Indeed, many soldiers had the audacity to run away by broad daylight before they were out of sight of Limerick Cathedral. The royal regiment, which had on the day of the review set so striking an example of fidelity to the cause of James, dwindled from fourteen hundred men to five hundred. Before the last ships departed, news came that those who had sailed by the first ships had been ungraciously received at Brest. They had been scantily fed, they had been able to obtain neither pay nor clothing, though winter was setting in, they slept in the fields with no covering but the hedges. Many had been heard to say that it would have been far better to die in old Ireland than to live in the inhospitable country to which they had been banished. The effect of those reports was that hundreds, who had long persisted in their intention of emigrating, refused at the last moment to go on board, threw down their arms, and returned to their native villages. Sarsfield perceived that one chief cause of the desertion which was thinning his army was the natural unwillingness of the men to leave their families in a state of destitution. Cork and its neighborhood were filled with the kindred of those who were going abroad. Great numbers of women, many of them leading, carrying, suckling their infants, covered all the roads which led to the place of embarkation. The Irish general, apprehensive of the effect which the entreaties and lamentations of these poor creatures could not fail to produce, put forth a proclamation in which he assured his soldiers that they should be permitted to carry their wives and families to France. It would be injurious to the memory of so brave and loyal a gentleman to suppose that when he made this promise he meant to break it. It is much more probable that he had formed an erroneous estimate of the number of those who would demand a passage, and that he found himself, when it was too late to alter his arrangements, unable to keep his word. After the soldiers had embarked, room was found for the families of many, but still there remained on the water-side a great multitude clamoring piteously to be taken on board. As the last boats put off, there was a rush into the surf. Some women caught hold of the ropes, were dragged out of their depth, clung till their fingers were cut through, and perished in the waves. The ships began to move. A wild and terrible wail rose from the shore, and excited unwanted compassion in hearts steeled by hatred of the Irish race and of the Romish faith. Even the stern Cromwellian, now at length, after a desperate struggle of three years, left the undisputed lord of the blood-stained and devastated island, could not hear unmoved that bitter cry in which was poured forth all the rage and all the sorrow of a conquered nation. The sails disappeared. The emaciated and broken-hearted crowd of those whom a stroke more cruel than that of death had made widows and orphans dispersed to beg their way home through a wasted land or to lie down and die by the roadside of grief and hunger. The exiles departed, to learn in foreign camps that discipline without which natural courage is of small avail, and to retrieve on distant fields of battle the honor which had been lost by a long series of defeats at home. In Ireland there was peace, the domination of the colonists was absolute, the native population was tranquil with the ghastly tranquillity of exhaustion and despair. There were indeed outrages, robberies, fire-raisings, assassinations, but more than a century passed away without one general insurrection. During that century, two rebellions were raised in Great Britain by the adherents of the House of Stuart, but neither when the elder pretender was crowned at Scone, nor when the younger held his court at Holyrood, was the standard of that house set up in Connacht or Munster. In 1745, indeed, when the Highlanders were marching towards London, the Roman Catholics of Ireland were so quiet that the Lord Lieutenant could, without the smallest risk, send several regiments across St. George's Channel to recruit the army of the Duke of Cumberland. Nor was this submission the effect of content, but of mere stupefaction and brokenness of heart. The iron had entered into the soul. The memory of past defeats, the habit of daily enduring insult and oppression, had cowed the spirit of the unhappy nation. There were indeed Irish Roman Catholics of great ability, energy, and ambition, but they were to be found everywhere except in Ireland, at Versailles and at St. Ildefonso, in the armies of Frederick and in the armies of Maria Teresa. One exile became a marshal of France. Another became Prime Minister of Spain. If he had stayed in his native land, he would have been regarded as an inferior by all the ignorant and worthless squireens who drank the glorious and immortal memory. In his palace at Madrid, he had the pleasure of being assiduously courted by the ambassador of George the Second, and of bidding defiance in high terms to the ambassador of George the Third. Scattered over all Europe were to be found brave Irish generals, dexterous Irish diplomatists, Irish counts, Irish barons, Irish knights of St. Louis and of St. Leopold, of the White Eagle and of the Golden Fleece, who, if they had remained in the house of bondage, could not have been in signs of marching regiments or freemen of petty corporations. These men, the natural chiefs of their race, having been withdrawn, what remained was utterly helpless and passive." A rising of the Irishry against the Englishry was no more to be apprehended than a rising of the women and children against the men. 
There were, indeed, in those days, fierce disputes between the mother country and the colony, but in those disputes the aboriginal population had no more interest than the Red Indians in the dispute between Old England and New England about the Stamp Act. The ruling few, even when in mutiny against the government, had no mercy for anything that looked like mutiny on the part of the subject many. None of those Roman patriots who poniarded Julius Caesar for aspiring to be a king would have had the smallest scruple about crucifying a whole school of gladiators for attempting to escape from the most odious and degrading of all kinds of servitude. None of those Virginian patriots who vindicated their separation from the British Empire by proclaiming it to be a self-evident truth that all men were endowed by the Creator with an unalienable right to liberty would have had the smallest scruple about shooting any Negro slave who had laid claim to that unalienable right. And, in the same manner, the Protestant masters of Ireland, while ostentatiously professing the political doctrines of Locke and Sidney, held that a people who spoke the Celtic tongue and heard mass could have no concern in those doctrines. Molly knew questioned the supremacy of the English legislator. Swift assailed, with the keenest ridicule and invective, every part of the system of government. Lucas disquieted the administration of Lord Harrington. Boyle overthrew the administration of the Duke of Dorset. But neither Molly knew nor Swift, neither Lucas nor Boyle, ever thought of appealing to the native population. They would as soon have thought of appealing to the swine. At a later period, Henry Flood excited the dominant class to demand a parliamentary reform, and to use even revolutionary means for the purpose of obtaining that reform. But neither he, nor those who looked up to him as their chief, and who went close to the verge of treason at his bidding, would consent to admit the subject class to the smallest share of political power. The virtuous and accomplished Charmont, a Whig of the Whigs, passed a long life in contending for what he called the freedom of his country, but he voted against the law which gave the elective franchise to Roman Catholic freeholders, and he died fixed in the opinion that the Parliament House ought to be kept pure from Roman Catholic members. Indeed, during the century which followed the Revolution, the inclination of an English Protestant to trample on the Irishry was generally proportioned to the zeal which he professed for political liberty in the abstract. If he uttered any expression of compassion for the majority oppressed by the minority, he might be safely set down as a bigoted Tory and high churchman. All this time hatred, kept down by fear, festered in the hearts of the children of the soil. They were still the same people that had sprung to arms in 1641 at the call of Anil, and in 1689 at the call of Tyrconnell. To them every festival instituted by the state was a day of mourning, and every public trophy set up by the state was a memorial of shame. We have never known, and can but faintly conceive, the feelings of a nation doomed to see constantly in all its public places the monuments of its subjugation. Such monuments everywhere met the eye of the Irish Roman Catholics. In front of the Senate House of their country, they saw the statue of their conqueror. If they entered, they saw the walls tapestried with the defeats of their fathers. At length, after a hundred years of servitude, endured without one vigorous or combined struggle for emancipation, the French Revolution awakened a wild hope in the bosoms of the oppressed. Men who had inherited all the pretensions and all the passions of the Parliament which James had held at the King's Inn could not hear unmoved of the downfall of a wealthy established church, of the flight of a splendid aristocracy, of the confiscation of an immense territory. Old antipathies, which had never slumbered, were excited to new and terrible energy by the combination of stimulants which, in any other society, would have counteracted each other. The spirit of popery and the spirit of Jacobinism, irreconcilable antagonists everywhere else, were for once mingled in an unnatural and portentous union. Their joint influence produced the third and last rising up of the aboriginal population against the colony. The great-grandsons of the soldiers of Galmoy and Sarsfield were opposed to the great-grandsons of the soldiers of Wolseley and Mitchelburn. The Celt again looked impatiently for the sails which were to bring succor from Brest, and the Saxon was again backed by the whole power of England. Again, the victory remained with the well-educated and well-organized minority. But happily the vanquished people found protection in a quarter from which they would once have had to expect nothing but implacable severity— by this time the philosophy of the eighteenth century had purified English Whiggism from that deep taint of intolerance which had been contracted during a long and close alliance with the Puritanism of the seventeenth century. Enlightened men had begun to feel that the arguments by which Milton and Locke, Tillotson and Burnett, had vindicated the rights of conscience, might be urged with not less force in favor of the Roman Catholic than in favor of the Independent or the Baptist. 
The great party which traces its descent through the exclusionists up to the roundheads continued during thirty years, in spite of royal frowns and popular clamors, to demand a share in all the benefits of our free constitution for those Irish papists whom the roundheads and the exclusionists had considered merely as beasts of chase or as beasts of burden. But it will be for some other historian to relate the vicissitudes of that great conflict and the late triumph of reason and humanity. Unhappily, such a historian will have to relate that the triumph won by such exertions and by such sacrifices was immediately followed by disappointment, that it proved far less easy to eradicate evil passions than to repeal evil laws, and that long after every trace of national and religious animosity had been obliterated from the statue brook, national and religious animosities continued to rankle in the bosoms of millions." May he be able also to relate that wisdom, justice, and time gradually did in Ireland what they had done in Scotland, and that all the races which inhabit the British Isles were at length indissolubly blended into one people. End of section 11 and end of chapter 17 of the History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay Recording by Jen Raimundo